Oh, we're live. We're live. You can find these old uh, type, not typewriters, like they have little screens. Yeah. But I think they came up before the internet and yeah, yeah. they're now selling them as uh, distraction free. That's really, that's when the first typewriter I had when I came to the university was it typed one line at a time. And that, that was cutting edge, right? And you what know, was that on a typewriter? No. It was a typewriter. But did it have a little screen? Yeah. Yeah. Very little screen that you could see a line at a time. You type it down and. Yeah. yeah, that's what I'm talking about. But now it's kind of remarketing yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How crazy is that? You no, I mean, that's that's one of the things about this. If you go to the ads, it's like, it's just you and what it so says. So for those at home, your paper. Father Dave has something called Remarkable. Remarkable, right. When did this come out? Um, this is the second version. So maybe three years would be my guess. Tell the people about it while I play with it. Yeah, yeah. So it's just <laughs> little things. One of the, I take notes all the time in meetings and homilies and somebody said, oh, you should look at the remarkable. I've said never even heard of it. But one of the selling points is its simplicity. You can't go online with it. Um, you can upload documents and you can write on the documents. But it has a feel. You feel it has a feel like a paper. It actually has even the sound, almost the sound of it. Yeah. I think it's made in maybe Norway. Where's the eraser? Or, uh, that box right here. That no, one? Down that there. That 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 thing. Yeah, that. And then you can just whatever you want. No, surround you it connect and then it. it'll cut it all out. Or the thing above it. This has got to be the most boring This is fantastic. Segment. People are going to love this. They're going to love it. It's like, we should have Father Dave come back more often. <laughs> See, but I forget that you're a podcast pro because you and uh, Me and Bob. Dr. Deacon, yeah, Mr. Bob. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Overachiever Bob yeah, yeah, yeah. have your own podcast. We What's do. it called? I'll um, give you this back. They that hope. They that hope. They that hope. Yeah. It was funny. We just got back from uh, leading a pilgrimage and somebody they'd never been a part of the university, but they went to they that hope. And I said, I'm not sure that's the best place to try to find out, but it, it worked out. <laughs> all right. Actually, I think it's more fun for us than it may be for anyone else, but that's always a cool thing. But that's thing. what makes podcasts fun. Yeah, it really is. It I really mean, is. If people we actually, we, fun. we started it in the middle of COVID when there wasn't a lot of hope. And, we, and that was really, mm. so we need to just bring some hope into this. So it's us just talking life. You know, and sports, apparently. We start with sports, yeah. We say saving marriages, one marriage at a time, because a woman came up to me and she goes, you know, I know nothing about sports, but now it allows me to have some kind of a conversation with my husband. So they've got this deal that she has to listen to the sports part and he has to listen to the part that's more of, it's really in some ways a commentary on culture and try to bring faith and hope in the midst of kind of a craziness right now. No, but this this is really great because I was telling you before we went on air that I, I like to write, but it's who's that comedian louis ck was recently on joe rogan's show and said that he has a computer that doesn't have the internet so he can do his work yeah because yeah. yeah you have these illusions of multitasking but then you try to get on and you're distracted by videos and then you're screwed well for me honestly when i go to the chapel in the morning and and i'm praying sometimes i want something that i can write down on or some notes that i have or, or a homily book but if i have my phone there's just too many distractions yeah. so this allows me it doesn't it doesn't provide me any access to any of that but allows me to write and pray and think and but you yeah. were saying because so i was trying to think like why would i want to get this and you take notes you can as you say upload PDFs and then kind of write on the right, PDFs. Right. That's also, that, that doesn't sound like enough for me to want to get this. Thing. Yeah. So what's the selling point? Not that you're here to sell it, but. Hmm. Yeah, I, I can't answer that question for you. What is it going to take for you to do uh -huh. it? That's something you're going to have to search your own heart. I think. <laughs> for, for, <laughs> let's for, do that now. Yeah, all right, let's I, come Lord I, Jesus. I, I, <laughs> Why I, should I, Matt, but. I think if, uh, if you could translate it, if it would translate to, they translate it to text? It will to, translate it to text, right, right. But how my, neat does your handwriting have to be? Well, for my handwriting is more like calligraphics. I mean, you cannot, <laughs> you cannot understand it. So, yeah, you push translate and it comes up and it says, are you kidding me? So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Very cool, very cool. And you were just in Germany? Yeah, I did. Actually, it was, it was really awesome. I took a group. Um, we did a pilgrimage to the Passion Play in mm -hmm. Oberammergau. Oh, which was just really, really beautiful. It's a, and I'm sure you're aware of it. I heard so, of it. Yeah, yeah. That's, I, have, so, I know nothing about it. Yeah, Passion so play has been going on for... for 450 years. It started in the middle of the plague. See and, you later. and they had this... Just don't uh, knock that thicker. camera. Nice job. They had... Uh, they middle of the plague, they made this deal that if uh, the Lord would free them from the plague, they would offer this passion play. So it's a small community. They've been doing it every 10 years uh, for 450 years. It's really cool. It's about maybe 500 people in this little community. They gather together. You have to have lived in the community for 10 years to be a part of it. Wow. We're the, cast, something like that. the cast is about 350 people. Uh, 
two and a half hours and then you break for dinner and you go to dinner in this little village. Some of the people in the cast are actually serving you. It's really quite beautiful. And then you've got the second uh, two and a half hours. Just a really beautiful thing. I must say it was somewhat ironic. We were supposed to go in 2020, but they canceled it because of the plague. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we're thinking uh, that the reason, the sole reason they did this was try to free them from the plague. So we're in the middle of a pandemic and they say, we're not going to do this, which mm -hmm. is another story. But yeah, it was great. And then we went from there, we went to Prague. Uh, visited Prague for Who's we? A, a group of about 45 pilgrims that traveled yeah. with me. Uh, went to Prague, a beautiful, beautiful city. I'm not sure if you've been. It's nope. beautiful, infinite Prague, had devotion there. Then we went from there to Bratislava and then Bratislava to Budapest. And then I got home the day before yesterday. I got yeah. a good infinite Prague joke. All right, let's hear it. So I, don't, the, I don't believe I know any infinite Prague jokes. <laughs> There's not many. This All might right, be the yeah. only one. So the infant of Prague walks into St. Joseph's workshop. And St. Joseph says, I don't care what your mother says, you're not going out dressed like that. <laughs> I like that. I like that. That's one of the things that I, I, I jokingly said to the people. It's, you know, we can look at that. Actually, it, there was somewhat of a, a I don't know, the, the first religious article, one of the first religious articles I remember getting was from my parish priest. And it was of a little medal of the infant of Prague. And honestly, Matt, I had that for 30 years. It just kind of showed up every move mm -hmm. I made. So there was kind of a devotion that I have to the infant of Prague. But I shared with my group that that we can look at this and we can say as Catholics, we can look at this and say, this is a little weird, right? That, that we dress this up every couple of days and change its outfit. And we can admit that if somebody else, like if a Protestant <laughs> brother or sister says that, we're going to be offended. It's like, what are you talking about? But we can, we're okay with it. So, well, I think it, it shows good. the universality of the church. Amen to that. I don't have to get every devotion, not no, every no, devotion. You don't have to, to be speak a part of it. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Yeah. And people ought not be offended by that. So where'd you grow up? Uh, Southwest Colorado. Yeah. How did you how did you end up in Steubenville? Go the go the long route. How did you, you become a, a Franciscan? Question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well yeah. It is so often so many things in my life I blame it on my parents. Um mom and dad uh prayed every day of their married life that one of their kids would become a religious, a priest or a, or a sister, and there are five boys in the family, uh, five boys and one girl in my family. So I joked that said, we pulled straws. It's like somebody's got to take one for the team, and we pulled straws, and I got the short or the long one, depending <laughs> on how my nieces and nephews are behaving. Uh, but the reality is, is honestly, there was never a time in my life that I didn't consider being a priest. It was always kind of in the back of my mind. I wrestled with it, tried to figure out what it is that the Lord wants me to do. Uh, remember we were up in the, I'm from the small town in the middle of the mountains. We were up in a cabin and a priest was, had joined my family, which was very common, very common place to have a priest around mm -hmm. the dinner table or on vacation with us. But uh, he says to me, what do you want to do when I grow up? And I said, well, I want to be a priest. Now my parents would say, if you had been a doctor, I'd have said, I want to be a doctor if you want yeah, to be. Yeah. So that's why I was studying law for a while. Okay. So I was a poli-sci pre-law major at the local college in my hometown but always really wrestling and struggling with maybe the Lord was calling me to be a priest and felt like I needed to just kind of get away from my small town, get away from yeah, a girlfriend I've been dating for a while, get away from school. So I spent a year on net of which I think you have. I a forgot finest. about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Net USA, yeah. what year? Uh, 85, 86. Okay. Yeah. I was two. Keep going. I don't think anyone asked. Anyone else? <laughs> Why, anybody? Asked how old anybody? Matt was? No? no, I don't, no, I don't think so. Bueller? Anyone? No. So, uh, <laughs> You know, but, you know, in just to that end, uh, net was one of the greatest experiences of my life. Really? I mean, it was, it was difficult Me too. and it was, but I, you, my guess is maybe it's fair to say you wouldn't be sitting here if it wasn't for net. It's probably right. I would not be sitting here if it wasn't for net, just the, the, the role that it played in my life. So I, I will be forever grateful for that. Uh, but it was wonderful. It was a wonderful opportunity to, um, just get away from everything and discern that Lord, what do you want me to do? Cause I was really at a place where I think that the Lord breaks into that. I was actually going to do it. I, I was really a place that whatever he wanted me to do, I wanted to do. You know, faith was always important in my life. There was never a time that I was like this. That's not to say it wasn't perfect, but, uh, but when I'm, when I fell, I went to confession. So there was never a time that the Lord was totally absent from mm -hmm. my life or it didn't matter. I mean, I'd go on vacation with my buddies and I would go to mass. They wouldn't, but I would go to mass. Yeah. Um, so mass was just, or liturgy, uh, Prayer was always a very important part of my life. Uh, what, what the, really the, one of the graces from Net was really the baptism of the Holy Spirit for me. You know, mm -hmm. I was raised. Mom and Dad were involved in Curcio. I don't know if you're how familiar are with things, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But and I, that I was never really, did it. really in many ways. The again, my mom were always faithful Catholics, but Curcio really made the sacraments more personal, Christ more personal. Their faith came alive with that. Mm. 
And so when I went on net again, was active in the church, but this experience of the Holy spirit becoming more, more present in my life, the Pentecost wasn't merely something that happened 2000 years ago, but the Holy spirit is to envelop us and to continue to be present to us. And that was just a very transformative experience in my life. I, and it was actually, I was going down, it was at the CYC, you, the CYC was long gone. When did you on net? I was on net in Canada and then in Ireland, Canada. so I never did it that's, in the States. That's up north of us. That's, right? that's, that's just above America. us. That's yeah, right. yeah, the Communist Republic of Canada. So, so they say, yeah. Um, I, and I'd never heard of Francis University in my life. At then it was the College of Steubenville. And I went in this little meeting and they talked about Francis University and I thought, yeah, maybe that I would transfer and go to school there. And oh, I, wow. I jokingly say that uh, I haven't gone very far because I'm still in Steubenville, Ohio. What is the baptism of the Holy Spirit for those who are unfamiliar with the term? Well, which is really, really great that you say that because I was unfamiliar with the term. I remember being around these people that they were singing and they were raising their hands and they were praying in the spirit. And this was all very new to me. Yeah. And, and I remember I found someone that I thought was somewhat normal. Right. And I said, what is going I'll on ask, here? I'll ask them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seriously. I, I, I literally wrote my letter, my dad a letter. You, if you're familiar with the letter. You write on a piece of paper, you oh. put an envelope and send <laughs> like it. Like on m- Remarkable? Yeah, 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 right. <laughs> um, but uh, I said, Dad, these people are so strange. But there was something about them that was alive. You know, um, I was kind of a loner in the sense that uh, there were not a lot of people of faith in my, I went to a public, we didn't have a Catholic high school, I went to a public high school. Uh, there just weren't a lot of people on my faith in faith. And to be around a group of people that actually seemed alive, you know, there's something really cool about it. Mm-hmm. So I asked this person what, what's going on with them. And she said, well, it's just Pentecost. Did you ask this question at net or before? Yeah, at net. It was yeah, at, at net. net, net you yeah. showed up and you didn't know what you were getting into. No, I didn't know what I was getting into. Now, net had only been around for two years. Okay. So it was only as the third year. So I'm years. sure it was uber charismatic uber, back then. <laughs> uber, 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 uber. Wow. Like, no holds barred. And uh, when, just real quick, when my mum came and visited Net Canada from okay. Australia, she okay. flew in for the decommissioning mass or yeah, whatever yeah, they call yeah, it. Yeah, that's not, yeah. That's not what they call no, it. We called it deep brainwashing, but that's oh, another okay. story. Yeah. Well, my mum's like, yeah, because she was a bit worried about me going. She went, yeah, no, it was good. I, I still think it's a bit of a cult, but you know, like just <laughs> yeah, throw a good away cult. Line. Yeah, a yeah. bit of a cult. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's funny when when my mom dropped me off. My mom was from the Twin Cities, so she came with me and spent some time with family. And when she dropped me off, she says, "You know, Dave, these these people might be charismatic." And and again, I was very active in my faith. I said, "Well, what does that what does that mean?" I said, "Am I charismatic?" And she goes, "Well, you are." but maybe not like them and never has a truer word than said, <laughs> right? But honestly, again, there was something really, really attractive about it. And, and I spoke to this woman, I, I was the eighth grade uh, catechism B champion. I don't know, have you ever had an eighth grade catechism B champion at your table? Never. Here we go, here we go. <laughs> Honored. We're gonna call this Pints with Pavanka after this, right? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but it was really, I, I'd never heard the baptism of the Holy Spirit because this one guy says to, comes up to me and he says, have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? And I really, it was really foreign to me. And in, in, in the light of that, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts of the Apostles. There are a few things, few phrases that are in all the Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles and baptism of the Holy Spirit is one of them. Really? Yeah. Baptism of the Holy Spirit, that phrase is yeah. in Matthew, Baptism, Mark, Luke, John, yep, Acts. Yep, yep. I had no idea. Yeah. I thought it was an Acts. But no, it's in, it's in all of them. Yeah, yeah. So, so I asked this woman, I said, you know, what's this all about? And she said, it's just Pentecost. Um, and then what she went on to say is that Pentecost isn't something that merely happened 2,000 years ago, but it's, it's this continued outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I mean, John Paul, Francis, Benedict, mm-hmm. all called for this renewal of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, and I remember I, it didn't make any sense to me the, the, the raising of the hands, the praying in tongues, all that kind of stuff was really foreign to me. Um, but I was by myself in, in the chapel, which was in the old Catholic, St. Paul Catholic CYC, Catholic Youth Center. Um, and I was just being honest with the Lord. You know, I said, I don't understand all this. It doesn't make sense to me. I was a little frustrated because I was... I, I, I was going to say I was born and raised. Nobody was born Catholic. Everybody's born pagan, but we get baptized and we become Catholic. And I said, I don't understand this, um, but if you want this for me, I want it. And, and honestly, Matt, I can look to that moment. At Literally at that moment, the presence of God comes upon me and and um, my life. I wouldn't be sitting here if it wasn't for that experience. What does that mean? The presence of God came upon me. What's that? What does that mean? The presence of God well, it, came it, upon it's, me it's like in a, in a subjective, yeah, 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 experiential yeah, yeah. sense? Yeah, um, yeah, so have you read Ralph Martin's uh, article on baptism of the Holy Spirit? No, I haven't. I okay. nodded, but okay. I haven't read okay. it. He, he, he talks about this and he actually quotes, I forget the name of the priest, who's actually quoting Aquinas. And, and he speaks of, uh, and 
he speaks of this idea of Aquinas would say a resending or a second sending or a new sending of the Holy Spirit. And he said that there would be two kind of elements or markers that would go with that. Uh, one is a sense of an inhabitation. Mm-hmm. That, that God was in the outside and now he's present. I'm being inhabited by him. And that's what my experience was, is that, mm-hmm. is that there was just this presence of God that I knew. It was, you know, we'll take a look at Luke, um, overshadowed, right? What does that look like? What does it mean to be overshadowed by the Holy Spirit? Well, this sense of God was just present to me. And and, and so often when we speak of the, the Lord, it's ineffable. We try to use words, but there was this closeness. There was this proximity. There was this... God wasn't out there. He was present to me. And, and I also began to uh, pray in tongues. And, and again, I'd never, nobody ever walked me through this talk about what is this and what does it look like? It was just in Romans 8, it says, uh, in our weakness, we don't know how to pray and the spirits prays through us. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I couldn't explain it at the time, um, but it was just, it just prayed. It just happened. Um, but then the other thing that Aquinas would go on to say is it said inhabitation and, um, and it's not innovation, it's something he uses. Newness. Something becomes new. Uh, it'll, the word will come to me. But that, and, and that was the other part of it, is that, is that I had this experience and then there was, new, there was a newness to my spirituality. The scriptures came alive. I mean, it wasn't just words on a page. They came alive to me. Uh, again, mass was always important to me, but there was something that, that I saw it differently. It's the road to Emmaus. My eyes were open. I just saw the Eucharist. I saw the sacraments differently than I did. Innovation, yeah, it is in, in habitation, innovation, that that there was this newness uh, from this experience that I had mm-hmm. uh, that, that changed me. I mean, it just changed me. I don't know if it was Chesterton, but since he's the repository of all good quotations, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, someone said, let your faith be more of a... Well, less of a syllogism, more of a love affair, something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like That's that. what it was like for me as well. Yeah. Uh, I think. Was that new to you when you went on that? Actually, you know, renewal? it's funny. It's funny. I say that. I don't know if I mean that. Um, I guess I mean there are times in my life, in my life even now, where I'll get really into apologetics because I'm very. I, I it feeds my soul, and mm-hmm. I, I find it very um, helpful in my spiritual life. But then I have to remember, like this is about a living love affair with Absolutely. the God who apparently likes me. Even if I don't like me, yeah, yeah, he yeah. does. No, 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 no. That's a, that's absolutely right. And a danger is to get, that we kind of get lost in some of those yeah. things, and we forget at the heart of this is about it's a safer. relationship. It's safer to it's have about, a syllogism. No, absolutely. Than to be vulnerable I, I, before the living God. I, I, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I've been reflecting on that. That I, I've been doing some work on God as as Father, and what does that look like? That He's our Father, and He reveals Himself. The Christian revelation that God is Father, and take a look at the Catechism. It speaks of that, and. It's easier to think of this God as a power because that doesn't necessarily demand a response. But mm-hmm. if God is a father, then then that by its very nature is relational and it demands a response from us. And uh, that, that mm. makes us uncomfortable sometimes. You know? Yeah, that's right. Like if God were merely a slave driver, there wouldn't be the level of intimacy that would require a sort of, yeah, response yeah, yeah, in yeah. the same way as if a, in a filial way. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, uh, I had a conversion. I was kind of agnostic I don't think I ever used the word, I didn't ever use the word atheist because that hadn't become a shorthand way of saying I'm more intelligent than you back in 2000. <laughs> but I was agnostic and I liked that term because it sort of left me open to kind of explore spiritual things, meditation and all these different yeah. religions without having to commit. But I went to World Youth Day in 2000 in Rome, in Rome. Okay. and I came back an insufferably happy Christian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about it? What was what happened there that changed you? Uh, you know what this is like when you've told your story a thousand times yeah. and then someone asks you again and you really you really want to say it as it happened. Yeah, you don't want to yeah, embellish. Yeah. Um, I was first struck by the joy, openness, and authenticity of the people on my flight from Sydney to That's cool. Rome. I was just like, these people don't There's cut each other different. down. Yeah, yeah. They're not sarcastic. Yeah. I mean, you got a long time to talk if you fly from Sydney to, yeah, to Rome. Yeah. So we got into everything, you know, how they were saving sex to a marriage, these people I was sitting with. And you were how old? 17. Okay. And they were just normal, well-rounded, good-looking, cool people. And I just was like, I do not get this. Because the mm. only Christians I'd met in my hometown were Assemblies of God, very, very uh, enthusiastic, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. maybe like the net people. And that kind of just turned me off. Mm-hmm, um mm-hmm. It probably says more about me than them. I'm sure they yeah, were very good yeah, people, yeah. but it did. 
So I was just, I started to pray for the first time in my life. Jesus, if you're real and this isn't just some story that old women believe because they're about to die. Like cover it, their bases. It yeah. would be the duck's nuts if you'd tell me because I'd love to know that and please reveal yourself to me in a way that I'd understand. You know? That's awesome. And there was just several experiences where I don't, at this point you run headlong into cliches and it's tough, yeah, but it was like, I've encountered someone who exists, who knows me. Who, who wants a relationship with me, who loves me, and life isn't meaningless. And it was yeah, just like yeah, you were saying, yeah, yeah. it was like this, oh my gosh, like he's present to me. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. yeah it's interesting. And, the, and only grace can do that because I think World Youth Day is a great example of somebody needed to tell Pope John Paul, this may not be a great idea. I mean, think about this. Here's, here's my pitch. Let's get <laughs> 2 million people together. Let's put them all outdoors. They can all sleep together that night. We'll just young people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With the, raging hormones. What, what, could, go, <laughs> what could, so, go could go wrong? What could go wrong? And yet the Lord really works. I, I've probably gone to maybe half a dozen World Youth Days. Have you, did you go to Rome? I did. You didn't did. say hello. Yeah, yeah. I, I looked for you, but okay. you just kind of walked off. No, I said I love everything about World Youth Day except World Youth Day. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, but it's great. No, it's so true. Like it is easy to get cynical about everything. It's just mm -hmm. a, it's an easy response. Hope is difficult. Cynicism is easy. Yeah, yeah. And, I, I, and I can imagine that a lot, a lot of the kind of poo-pooing of World Youth Day just comes from the cynicism. You yeah. know, you get all these bloody kids. They're just there for a trip. They're not there for Jesus. It's yeah. like, yeah, I wasn't for any of it. You're right. That is exactly true. And I would have hooked up with someone if I could have. Yeah, yeah. But no one was interested. <laughs> so <laughs> I encountered the Lord instead and my life you know, changed forever. When I, when I first came to the university, when I was ordained, I taught for a couple of years. And one of the things I had them do is basically do a timeline of their faith just to, mm. to think back and reflect on, on these markers. I think it's important for us to be able to have these markers of, and this would have been in 96. I was amazed at the number of people at World Youth Day Denver was that marker for them. So, uh, and, and it was often as much as you stated, it was the relationships, it was the people that really stirred something in them. So again, I, I've participated in many World Youth Days and where I was this far from an absolute disaster and people come about it and they're converted and they encounter the Lord. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I've been to big theme parks and Metallica concerts and all sorts of things, and maybe people were happy there, but the kind of joy that radiated, the selflessness, all that, it's unlike anything, you know? Yeah. It's the largest gathering of human beings in European history, I'm told. Yeah. World Youth Day, Rome 2000. It was terrific. Yeah, I was, was it just European history? It was Well, I think Manila was, was the Manila largest, because that was seven million. Manila. Okay. Isn't that insane? Seven it was million. Nuts. Like, I remember walking home after that World Youth Day in Rome, and actually the best was Australia. Were you, you Australia? No, I was sitting in a freezing, f cold Irish office where I used to watching it on it YouTube. Was, it was wishing. really fantastic. It really was. But why I is mean, that? I think honestly because it was a little smaller. Mm. Honestly, it's a long way to go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the weather was beautiful. They had organized it very well. Yeah, but I walking back from Rome, everything was so crowded. We ended up yeah. going into a McDonald's. There was a group. Maybe I think we took. I know we took we took over 500 people and it was crazy so but that with me there crazy. was maybe 30 in that particular group we went to the basement the ground where all the kids play in a mcdonald's and we stayed there for three hours we slept they fed us wow. it was phenomenal yeah and i remember world youth day in toronto i went there mm -hmm. and i remember reading these articles in the newspaper there was this i wish i still had this article it was a journalist who was saying that up until now, he's been a closet Catholic, mm -hmm. and everyone was expecting this to be a negative experience for the city, but there just was all this positive feedback, even from non-Christians who were like, the joy right, of these right, people, right. it's, it's hard right. to remain angry That's with right. them. That's absolutely right. Just watching people on the streets and them watching us, it's really, it's a great, yeah, it's a great experience. Yeah. But, so you became a priest in what year? Yeah, when yeah, did so, you join the Franciscans, and yeah, why was it the Franciscans yeah, so in particular? I, I um. I transferred to Francis University from Net, mm. uh, so I was a, came in as a sophomore, middle of sophomore year, and um, it was honestly when I came here, I was pretty sure what the, this was what the Lord wanted. Now, forgive to, me, yeah, what yeah. year? I'm not. I'm not trying to tell you how old you are again, but what year did you? <laughs> what year was that? <laughs> yeah, I came in in eighty eighty six. Eighty six. And um, so I never went to Franciscan, so, so I'm probably going to ask some pretty ignorant okay, questions okay. here. But the the prior who was who was the guy who got the, everything the back on track? The president at the time was Mike's father. That's Mike right, Scanlon. Father Mike yeah, Scanlon. Yeah, yeah. Forgive me. Yeah, I heard that Franciscan was once on Playboy's top ten party, party universities. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're making different lists now, but yeah. <laughs> Thank yeah, God. Yeah, yeah. But now, now that I've crazy. thrown that out, you got to tell us what what happened at well, Franciscan. It, yeah, it was really crazy. I mean, th this was when. 
early 70s when okay. small across across the country small schools particularly small private schools were trying to find their way uh, enrollment was low tommy moore which was the largest dorm at the time was basically empty and um yeah there was, this was cross board across all not that's not fair lots of schools at the time uh francis university was yeah party school small school I was voted one of the top 10 schools in Ohio to close and that kind of thing. There just was not a lot of uniqueness or anything different about it. So when they hired Father Mike, uh, Father Mike had a couple of pretty simple uh, elements or, or plans about what he wanted to do. Uh, Jesus was going to be the center of our life. The center of the life of the university was going to be Christ. A Catholic school should be faithful to to Christ as our Savior. And so that the academics were important, obviously, formation of the student, their intellect was important, essential. Um, but to do that apart from the formation of their life and a formation of creating men and women that were going to become um, holy and become saints, those two things had to come together so that there was not a separation between faith and reason. The two actually can illuminate one another. Mm. And then the other was that uh, we were going to be faithful to the teachings of the church. Late 60s, Catholic universities wanted to kind of create a separation, sense of autonomy from, from the church. Um, and Father Mike said, no, it seems to me a Catholic university should be close and and so the teaching of the church faithfulness to the magisterium was going to be key uh so those were the two principles i mean what father mike would always say that there wasn't this great plan you know how did you do this father mike yeah. i worked with father mike his last years as president and he said i didn't have this great plan what i knew is that we we're going to be faithful to the lord and we we're going to be faithful to the church and and he said to the board he said if this doesn't work okay but at least we're going to give it a shot. And we're so going did, to try. Did Father? Well, did people around Father Mike just expect that he was going to see Franciscan into the night? That it would be done shortly well, over the next few years? Some of them, Father Mike would say, some of the board members, yeah, he was going to kind of be the one who's going to close the doors, turn out the lights. Wow. Um, but but the other part of it, and it was you know back to some of our conversation earlier. Father Mike was one of the first and most influential people in the renewal. Okay. Uh, and and he he firmly believed that this was a work of the Holy Spirit and and God was going to bless this and and we're sitting here because of of Mike's faithfulness. Um, but the other part that he he thought was important, he would always speak at the beginning of the year. Studies have shown that the loneliest person in the world is a college freshman. Mm. And and Father Mike experienced through the renewal um, and the other friars of the community he lived with the necessity for relationship and communion and, and accountability. So he in, installed what was called household systems at the beginning. It's it's like a, a wing of the residents would be a small faith group. So at the beginning, everybody had to be a part of a household. When when Father Mike initiated this, you had to be a part of the household. Small faith groups that would uh, pray together, intramural sports together, go to mass together celebrate you know faith together devotions together and that was really one of the i think the unique remarkable things that father mike brought was this idea of household so that now we have about 60 households on campus small faith communities small faith groups that support one another's faith so the the kind of the peer pressure on campus is more towards a life of virtue rather than a life of vice which yeah, is not what it is exactly what, right. what's not what it is on most college campuses yeah i actually asked a couple of university students about what it was like and they said, like, if you want to grow as a Christian, it's it's easy. Yeah. If you want to party, it's actually more difficult. <laughs> right, right. That's so fair. So the peer pressure, as you that's say, fair. it leans that's that fair. way. That's yeah. fair. It's not a utopia. I mean, everything is not perfect, but no. we've got it. I, I would say we are, there's no university across the board that's like Francis no, University. Yeah. Is. Yeah. yeah. So how did Franciscan turn around then? I mean, there were these things making Christ the center mm -hmm. and things like that, but I mean, well, one of the things Father Mike did is uh, that he felt that philosophy and theology needed to be center. If we're going to be an academic institution that's Catholic, we need to focus on that. So Father Mike went after some really good theologians. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Alan Schreck, I don't know if you know Schreck, Alan. What a guy. Yeah, Alan, I think Alan is, is really um, underappreciated. Mm -hmm. I mean, Alan's just, in, in my life, he's been a great blessing, but also to the to the, uh, the university and the theology department. Uh, a couple of the friars that got theology. Obviously, Father Mike was the one who hired Scott Hahn. And, when when and, was that? Do you know, remember? I want to say Roughly? 92. Okay. It was after I had left. So I graduated in 89. And, and, and was this short? Was he teaching at a Catholic school prior to being hired? 
I don't think, uh, forgive me, I'm not positive. Yeah. I think he was just finishing up at Marquette. Wow. Is my, yeah. Wow. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. So that, that was really a part of it is, is that creation of, of the theology and philosophy departments that would be key. And then also creating a culture. It's interesting since I've been back at the university, a lot of people have come to me and they said, you know, what would it look like for us to do what you've done, whether it be a high school or another you, you college or stuff. And what they often do is, is that they focus on the students, which obviously is important, but you also have to surround yourself. You have to have a, a team of faculty and staff that want to be a part of this. So oh. that's what Father Mike did is he surrounded himself with people that had the same desire, the same vision, the same goals, the same uh, desire to put the Lord in the center of their life and be faithful to the church. And then the Lord just built on that. Wow. You know, even when I came, I came in 96 or 86, Tommy Moore was still largely. What is Tommy empty. Moore? Tommy, St. Thomas Moore is the largest oh. residence hall. Sorry about that, Tommy Moore. <laughs> it's the largest residence hall that we have. Uh, it was still largely empty. Today we have, uh, we've added two, since then we've had two, Two new residence halls, and we're this largest class we've ever had. Yeah, in this our, is the, in, large, in largest, the largest incoming freshman class, class ever in, in our history, right? Why is that? I don't know. Um, I mean, I, I like to think that that we're trying to do the same thing that Father Mike did, and that's just be faithful to Jesus and, and faithful to what he's asking of us. Uh, I think one of the things that had a really a great impact at the right now where we are now was in the midst of COVID, we had what we call the step in faith. And so this would have been obviously in March of 20, everybody, everything closed down, the whole world closed yeah. down. And I was with my team and just wrestling, like, what are we gonna do? Cause already people, you know, Harvard was already laying people off and telling the students that they couldn't come back in the fall. And that, and that just didn't seem the path for me. I, 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 I sense that that wasn't what we we're supposed to do. And, and I remember I would continually say, I think the Lord just asked us to take a step in faith. I don't know what that's going to look like. So I got from a, a friend of mine who who's re related to the university, he sent me an email and he said, you know, what if, what if we just gave free tuition to everyone? And I'm thinking like, that's who the stupidest that? thing I've ever who heard. Who said that? Yeah. A friend? A friend, yeah. Just yeah. Email <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Out of the blue. <laughs> now his thing was to give it to everybody and all that. And I thought, so I just ignored it. It's like, all right, it's, that's just funny. But I couldn't shake it. You know, I go to prayer and it's like, you know, step in faith, what would that look like? So it was funny. I went to our finance person and I said, I'm, what if? I said, Hear me out. Yeah. I said, well, what, what, what I said is, what if we just provided free tuition to all? Because the question was, were our new students going to come? Our yeah. freshmen going to come with everything going on? And I said, what if we just said, all right, this first semester, because they're so, it's scary. I mean, you remember what that was. It was just, yes, it I said, was. what if we just said they didn't have to pay tuition? We just let them come. Uh, and he looked and he goes, Oh, that could be a really good idea. Maybe that's maybe that's what we're supposed to do. So I kept on finding somebody to tell me. But I mean, honestly, Matt, this speaks to the type of people that we've got You're at the university. Wrong. If your finance officer is yeah. like, great idea, let's yeah. not take well, money. And, and I took it to the board, and one of our board members said, uh, he goes, this is a no-brainer. I think this is exactly How, what Why the Lord, is it a no-brainer? What would have happened if you hadn't? What, what, what was the benefit of it? I mean, other uh, than a huge doing, influx of yeah. freshmen. But well, we'll, and that's just, well, we didn't know. We didn't know. Are, were kids going to come? Were students going to come? Um, and by students, do you mean freshmen? Or yeah, who, by who freshmen. got free tuition? Uh, we, what we did is all new students got free tuition and all- For the year? For the semester. Okay. Yeah. And all returning students got a free semester of graduate school if they choose to do that. And, and part of it was, again, a step in faith. I remember because it, it was a fairly substantial- investment from our uh, board of trustees in appro uh, approving that right and saying <laughs> yeah. okay but but honestly people were interested fox news they ended up doing a piece on this no way. and and they were like what are you doing when, when when schools were literally doing exactly the opposite saying you can't come you can't come you're saying <laughs> you can come right and really, for free and for free it was funny when <laughs> Neil Cavuto was the guy at Fox News that was talking he goes he goes honestly father this is just a shot at the Jesuits isn't it and I said no <laughs> no but, but what, what I ultimately said was that near near Francis's death he said I have done what is mine to do may the Lord show you what is yours and I said this Amen. is what the Lord has for us to do right mm. so honestly uh, one of the markers yeah, yeah. There's, there's just a lot. There was a lot around this that one of the faculty members came and he got emotional and he said, Father Dave, I've been here for 12 years. Um, this is the first time I really felt like we bet on ourselves. We're betting on ourselves. That, that the thought was that we're going to do this and they're going to come and they're going to experience what we have at the university and they'll stay. Yeah. What would have been a train wreck is if, if everybody would have come and said, okay, I've got my semester and now we're going on and we're yeah. not going to come back.
That really would have been, but that's not what happened. That's not what happened. So a couple of things. One, my goal was if we invited to be people to be a part of it, we said, if, if you like what's going on, you think this is cool, help support us. I was in my office one afternoon and, and I hear my secretary, she's going through the mail and she goes, oh my, oh no, <laughs> Father Dave, you need to see this. Well, oh this, dear. This guy wrote a check out of his checkbook for a million dollars. No way. Yeah. yeah. He said, uh, I heard what you're doing. He goes, I've never seen anything like this. But, but what it spoke to me is when people see individuals or institutions operating in faith, they want to be a part of that. Yeah. So we got $3.4 million of donations in a little over a year to this program. That is remarkable. People saw that and they said, I want to be a part of that. And I think part of what's going on now is still a grace of that. Is, And, and I would share with the faculty and staff that it's not, this isn't a one and done, that this is how we we as Christians are called to operate. This this getting out of the boat and walking on water. I mean, I, I imagine what Peter must have felt like the first step or two. It's like, dude, this is crazy. I'm literally walking on water. It's not a bad place to be. A bad place to be that says, Lord, if you don't come through, I'm going to drown. I mean, I mean, I prayed this. I said, Lord, if this doesn't work out, this is going to be the shortest presidency in the history because I'd only been there for seven months and... Uh, <laughs> Um, but the Lord's blessed. Wow. Him. Yeah, he's really blessed. I mean, him. that is what we said earlier, let my faith be less of a syllogism, more of a love affair. I mean, that's an active faith that yeah, really yeah. believes in a real Jesus Christ yeah, who yeah, yeah. really blesses yeah, people yeah, yeah. and works. Yeah, so it's cool. So I think part of it is, is wow. the grace to that, yeah. Um, I want to I want to talk about uh, the kind of encroaching wave of wokeism upon universities and see what you guys are doing. Yeah. But I want to preface that by saying this. Um, we live in a sexually broken, confused society. We don't know what men are, apparently. We don't know what women are, apparently. We don't know what marriage is. We're not even really sure what sex is. <laughs> and so the people coming out of this are people like me and Neil and you and others. So... Obviously, we want to um, minister to those who are confused or in sin. We want to love them and welcome them. But like, so where's that balance between loving and welcoming people who are coming into your universities now and also putting the foot down and saying, no, men can't become women. And I, I don't know. I actually don't know what Franciscan has done about this. Yeah, I'm looking yeah, forward yeah. to learning. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the balance. So where is that balance? And I think the balance is truth is that we're, we're living in a world that is just, I mean, I mean, the, the word truth is to some, it's oppressed yeah, to the woke, right? Well, what do you mean by truth? Your truth, you, 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 they get nervous just about that word that I'm trying to put upon them truth and what is truth. I mean, Pilate said, what is truth, right? And, and the world is saying the same thing is, is, is what is truth is that, that ultimately we live in a world that has totally rejected any sense of objective truth. Even it's funny, again, this could be a, a tangent, but during COVID, it was all follow the science, follow the science, follow the science. Mm -hmm. But let's not follow the science on this. I mean, the the whole idea of what is male and what is female. I mean, that's an objective reality that that one can determine that through science. And yet, we now are, are li being invited to just ignore that, to close your eyes towards that. And and I think that honestly that we as as a university, particularly as a university, have something to say to this, that that we've got the different sciences. So we can ask the question of what is male, what is female from a theological point of view. We can ask it from a philosophical point of view. We can ask it from a biological point of view. And what we find when we find that is that it brings us to the same place, right? But we live in a world that wants to separate all that and separate the, the truth and the reality from what an individual feels. Um, yeah. And, and that's, I think, I think, again, as a university, we have a particular voice that we can give to the chaos that we find ourselves in right now. But you're absolutely right, Matt, is that we've got more and more young people that are, I used to say that, that they were questioning, um, you know, who am I, who am I, who am I? Now it's what am I? And that's a fundamentally different question. I mean, one of the questions that we were, we're dealing with in the university is one of the individuals, kind of an older professor, was talking about in the whole gay lesbian trans gay and lesbian issue and and that issue and, and how we wrestle with that but why is it that the transgendered is seems to be even so deeper and more mm -hmm. difficult and one of our theology persons said because it's a philosophical question this is a metaphysical question it's 
what, who am I? It's not merely about sexual morality. Right, right. It's or, about or, or sexual attraction. Yeah, or, yeah. Right, right. But this is this <clears> gets <throat> to the very fundamental identity of the human person. And and the idea that, that the wokeism, the woke culture says, is that I'm the determining. I get to determine what that is. Where we as Catholic Christians, no, 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 no. That's, that's been determined. So it's very part of our DNA. It, it's been determined by by creation from the very beginning. Uh, so that's, I, I love this. I love this discussion. I love this conversation because uh, I think Franciscan University stands in contrast to, again, other, other schools, other Catholic schools. I pray that they're being faithful. But what I know is that we're going to be faithful in, in that the light of God, the light of the church, the light of the scriptures is going to help illuminate that discussion and, and with us. Yeah. So how do you guide your professors in this? Is there any, because I'm sure people are confused. I don't know what it's like. Have you had people, because I know it's obviously you probably have an influx of conservative kids or kids who are faithful Christians, but are you also having people who are living LGBTQ lifestyles who are telling you, I'm actually a woman when they're a man? Is that happening yet? And and what kind of advice do you give to your professors? How do they deal with that? Yeah, yeah. we, we actually talked quite a bit about it. Is, is that happening not a lot. Now, part of that could be ch- people are choosing not to come because they know what we represent. Um, as you and I were talking later, uh, I wrote a piece for USA Today when this whole situation was taking place with a swimmer at Penn. I'm mm. sure you're familiar with Lied, this individual. Is, that, is it the Leah Thomas <laughs> Yeah, fella? yeah, yeah, yeah. So he wants to, I mean, he literally is swimming for the men's team, goes away in COVID and comes back and he's now swimming for the women's team. And it's being applauded and celebrated and Good courageous. Good for you for calling courageous. him. Good for you for doing that. We mean no disrespect no, to this no, not man, at all. but not I but I think all. it's great that you're doing that because not at all. Yeah, it really bothers me. Even the words "biological male" that well, bothers me. me. That tell, feels like a concession. Me, let Sorry. me tell my story. Yeah. Thank you very much. So I, you know, I was I was just praying one morning and and actually watching that that morning. Um, we had an athlete at the university. She's about five foot nothing, just tough as nails. She's all American runner and just. And I was just watching and thinking about her and very simply, what's fair, you know, that, that if an individual quote unquote identifies as a woman and now races against her, she doesn't have a chance. So I wrote a piece called The Body Matters. I mean, it wasn't, I, I didn't, the first draft was more a little bit theological, but what we finally came to was just pretty simple. The body matters, you know, that that the human person is is flesh and bone, and, and that matters, right? And I said that it, it's simply, I said, I look at a president, I look at one of my students who, who trains hard and works hard. It's not right. It's not fair that she should have to compete against an individual that has a male body and in the male muscular in all, in all mm-hmm. of this. I said scientifically, there's a reason why we have categories and weights and men's and women's sports and all that. And so I submitted it to uh, USA Today, which was I didn't honestly I didn't figure they would accept I it. Think so either. Well, but they did with with a couple of stipulations, and actually we went back and forth on whether or not we wanted to to go ahead and, and cop and let them print it. One of them was the use of biological male or female. Oh, I they, see. they wouldn't allow you, an individual, their editorial board won't allow you to use that term. So they said, uh, if, if you're going to do this, we're going to have to not use that language. So honestly, myself and my team, we came back and we prayed about it. And we thought about it. And we said, do we still want to go with this? And obviously we chose to go with it. To, to allow that change to be made, partly because there was no sense of reason anywhere in this conversation. Everything was was pro what was going on. And and I said, at least it provides a voice that is, yeah. that, that is the other side. And then what was the other thing that they changed? Uh, I, f- I forget Why what was it was. USA Today your first pick? I would have thought. Well, we, well, we put it out in lots of various ways. I think that we as, as Catholic Christians have a duty, if we have a God platform, have a duty and obligation to enter into that arena, is, is that we need, I mean, there are Catholic publications that would have printed it exactly the way I want it. But I think we need to dialogue with the, the world, the unbelieving world. We need to dialogue mm-hmm. with that. We need to be a voice of reason, a voice of sensibilities, a voice of truth, ultimately. So... Have you got much pushback that. for that? Well, it's interesting. From Catholics, and, and because whenever I speak about this, I'll have a good deal of Catholics sort of write to me, even privately, and say, don't get into these issues. Just talk about the beauty of the Catholic faith. No need to get into these sort of thornier things. What do you... 
Did you get any of that? And what was your response? Um, I mean, you, you get the typical, I mean, Fr Francis University just got voted in Ohio, one of the worst places to go to school if you're LGBT and you want to, you know, live in that activism world, which you need to which, make that, a badge. which is, which is <laughs> that, okay. okay. I mean, that does, that doesn't bother me at all. In fact, it was interesting. And we had this, another situation that, uh, yeah, that we're just not going to buy into that. We're not going to buy into that world. We're not going to buy into the wokeism world. The whole cancer, this is something that I, I think about the whole being canceled, all that. So I was praying about this one morning and, and when I wrote that article and then we had a situation with an individual who, who pulled out a, a pride flag. I saw that. Yeah. And on stage, on right? Stage, she right, was graduation, accepting her. Right. And, and we, we cut that out of the, of the, um, the video of, of the, the graduation. Official, yeah. Right. Right. And we just got from one contingent of the population, we got a lot of crap about that and how could you do this and blah, 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 blah. Well, I mean, again, Francis University is going to be faithful to the teachings of the church. We're going to be faithful to the gospel. And that's just inconsistent. And it's the other, it's rude. I mean, it's just rude. That's just civility in the middle yeah, of we're this. We're awarding right, you right, something. Right, right, In the middle of it. And it was a graduate student. She, mm. there's a the whole thing went to it. Well, so an individual um, wrote me in, with a check and said, uh, Father Dave, you continue to do things that make me proud. And he said, I want to support what you're doing. Yeah. And I think, there, yes, we get pushback and yes, we get people. But to, to that end, somebody said to me, aren't you afraid that you're going to be canceled? That's a good question. Yeah, because well, if this continues, and it is, when when does this become a civil rights issue? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a big question. But the, the whole cancel, I, I found myself thinking, reflecting on that, that um, you can't cancel somebody who hasn't subscribed, Right. So if you've got a subscription to something, you can cancel it. I don't subscribe to that world. I don't subscribe to the worldview that, that says there is no difference between men and women. I don't subscribe to the worldview that truth can't be known. I don't subscribe to the worldview that says the human person determines what is the human person. I don't subscribe to the worldview of what is marriage. And so from that perspective, I, what does it look like to be canceled? I don't know. Now, there are other legal issues that are going on in the culture and the world today. Um, that we need to be attentive to. I mean, uh, there there is a part of me that that gets a little anxious. I don't want to draw undue attention to the university because there are there are organizations out there that are looking for mm -hmm. institutions and people to sue. You know, that's just the world that we live in. I'm aware of that. and I'm attentive to that. I'm not going to be stupid, but I'm also not going to hide. And, and I think that the the nature of the incarnation <clears throat> is a God who in, in in becomes a part of the messiness of the world. He doesn't hide from it. He doesn't run away from it. He doesn't build a wall around, but he enters that. And, and we need to be able to do that. And now I always say at the university, what we're going to do is we're going to do that in truth. Mm. Uh, we're going to do that in charity and we're going to do that in humility. Take any three of those away. You've got a problem, but continuing to engage the world, the brokenness of the world, individuals in the world with truth, charity and humility. Yeah. We'll throw the dice on that. So how does, uh, like what freedom does somebody have if they come to Franciscan as, and then they identify as gay? And, you, know, uh, you know, can they be uh, flying around a rainbow flag? Is that an acceptable thing? Or where do you draw what, the line? What I, because you want to avoid being censorial, presumably. Right, right, right. No, but you absolutely. Also, yeah. Well, one of the things is that the reality is, do we have students on campus that that struggle with that? And I absolutely. One of the things I'm really proud of is um, about two years ago, uh, some students came and they wanted to start a program called Integratus, uh, Integratus, the integration. Okay. And what they wanted was a place where uh, young men and women who are struggling with these questions and with these issues can come together and be disciples and be community together, but be faithful to the Beautiful. teaching of the church and be faithful to the gospel. Uh, and this was a student initiative and, and we worked with them and they worked with a couple of the people from the theology department mm -hmm. and from the student life department. And and I really would, I, I hope we're just, actually we just came up publicly. I just came out, that sounds like, good, mm -hmm. but publicly with this, because I really wanted them to have a couple of years of, of, of working through this. And what is, I wanted to clear, I don't want a support group. You know, they are not, it is not a support group for being gay. It is a support group for being a disciple of Jesus. That's what it is. And it's men and women who are asking questions and wrestling with these issues and struggling with it. 
Um, but they want to be faithful to the gospel. They want to be faithful to the teachings of the church. So I'm really, really proud of our students that are doing this and in a program that they're getting with, with um, direction from, from the friars and direction from uh, some of the faculty and staff, mm. but it was, it was student initiated and student led. And it's really an exciting program. Are these some of the top questions that parents ask when they're calling Franciscan today? Not a, honestly, not a lot, Matt, no. because um, I think people, more and more people know who we are. And that's the, that's the thing about it that, that, you know, when I wrote this piece that the USA today, I, USA today picked another uh, op-ed piece that I wrote on, on the abortion issue. Um, on the abortion issue or yeah. transgender issue? Well, I, I've written, USA Today's picked up two pieces okay. that I've written, uh, op-ed pieces. One was on the abortion issue and then one was on the transgender issue. People expect that. I mean, th that's a good problem to have, right? People expect us mm. to be faithful. So that's a, there's actually, that's quite liberating that, that when I did this, it wasn't like, oh, I'm surprised Franciscan University did this. I'm surprised. It's like, yeah, we would expect Franciscan University, we would expect Father Dave uh, to speak on this, to speak to this, yeah. But I th you know, you said earlier, people know who we are, but sometimes we think we know who people are and then they start changing because of pressure. Yeah. And I think that's, that's where my questions are coming from. Like at what point does the pressure grow so much that Franciscan starts making small allowances here and there until they're awash in wokeism? But it sounds like it's not happening. Glory yeah, to God. There's, there's a, I'm sure you know who Vince Lombardi is. Mm -hmm. You do? I know the name. Oh, good, good, good. So he was obviously, I think they won two or three Super Bowls in a yeah. row. And, and then over a couple of years, their team was horrible. And they asked him what happened. And he said it was death by inches. Yeah. He said it was a lot of smaller decisions that they made that individually didn't seem like such a big deal. But when they look back on it. So mm. that's, that's the thing is we, we, we try to continue to ask the question. We want to continue to, to be faithful to the teachings of the church. And yeah, I mean... We're continually doing the best that we can. Now, with that being said, your mm -hmm. initial question is, um, we have more and more young people that are being deeply impacted by the culture today. And, and we've got really good students, really smart kids that, that want to love God and want to be faithful to the church. But there's no way, depending on in some ways what their upbringing is, that they can't be impacted by this. You know, so we have to recognize that and see that, that we can't do ministry, we can't treat them the same that we did 25 years ago because the world that they're coming out of yeah. is substantially different. I mean, honestly, some of the things that quote unquote, the culture finds normal today, 25 years ago would have been. I was just gonna say that, can you imagine going back in time and telling Father Michael Scanlon what sort of things you're gonna have to wrestle no, with in 2022? No. no, I mean, just, I mean, some of these, what is a man? I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. The, mm. the fact that we even have to have this conversation and discussion. So, so they're being impacted by that. So we want to be really intentional about their formation. One of the lines that maybe they get tired of me saying is that what does it profit a man to gain the world and lose his soul? Right? So, so that we've got a student who's been well, quote unquote, educated. That's great. Formed for a career. That's fantastic. But if they're not being formed to be a saint as well, then we're doing something wrong as a Catholic university. So that we want to see that the young people are being formed, educated, and, and sent out, right? This is the mm. Franciscan sent out on yeah. a mission, whatever it is, business person, doctor, lawyer, teacher, and, and that they want to love the Lord and be faithful to the Lord. I just had a friend, Tony Foy. Did you meet him? He just came in from Ireland. Good mate of mine. He met with so. some faculty. He's the head of Net Ireland, actually. Okay, okay. And he was sitting across the table from me here and he just got back from noon mass at Franciscan and his mouth is ajar like, this is incredible. Yeah. And it really is. That is the experience. People like me from Australia or these other countries, they come to America to these faithful pockets and yeah. they're just blown away because yeah. you guys are packed to the gills. Yeah, no, it's really, we have four masses a day. Four it's, masses yeah, a yeah, day? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's really cool. One of the times we had somebody was, uh, you know, mother came out, she was visiting with her daughter and she was crying. And she said, I've never seen anything like that. Yeah. I mean, there's something about being with a community that gets it, that worships, yeah. that loves the Lord, that loves the sacraments, that recognizes Jesus' presence. Yeah. I'm, I'm, mm. I, I love it. Yeah. I just, side note, love living in Steubenville. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I really, that's really do. I that's think fantastic. for a while in the beginning, I kept telling myself that because I wanted to kind of like, it's like when your intellect has to lead the emotions. Yeah. Come yeah, yeah. on. Yeah. But the more I'm here, I just love it. Um, so last night, was it last night? Yeah, last night, the Newtons. 
Oh, had sure. uh, praise and worship at their house. Oh, that's great. My kids like, can we please go to praise and worship? And I didn't want them yeah, to because yeah, yeah, yeah. it's been we've had several late nights, so we need to go to bed. But like, fine, you can go yeah, to praise yeah. and all worship. Right, all right, <laughs> yeah. And it's just, funny when when I was at. So I, I was ordained. I graduated from the university. I got ordained here. Um, you you'd ask why the Franciscans? Yeah, uh, I, I partly probably because five brothers. You know, brotherhood was has been really really important to me. Um, I knew that I couldn't do this by myself. You know, I think I, again, God bless the diocesan liturg- uh, yeah. priest, and and that's really heroic. And I just, I, I maybe I'm not strong enough. I don't know, but I knew that I needed accountability. I knew that I needed brothers. I knew that I need guys who could kick me in the butt, but then also that I could journey with. But the other is the main charism of my community is Metanoia, which is that that constant, continual conversion. The first time I heard that word was on net. So that when I was looking at this particular Franciscan community, the TORs, and saw that their main charism was met in a way, there was something that just resonated in that. So that's why I, I joined this community. But so it was ordained, worked here for a number of years, left for, and then came, came Ooh, back. You left, you said? I, I was at the university. I left. Uh, I was reassigned I from, from the university for yeah, yeah, yeah. eight, for about 11 years. But I was driving through Steubenville in February of 2019. February in Steubenville is not the most nope. beautiful place nope. in the world. <laughs> not the most beautiful place in the world. And I'm driving through. I was invited to come and give a talk on campus in um, February. And, and the Lord was already speaking in just some sense of change. And so I'm going through and I'm looking at the town. And, and I said to myself, you know, Stoom feels kind of charming. And as soon as I said that, I said, oh, Uh-oh. crap. <laughs> I did. I said, something's going on. And about maybe four weeks later, um, there was a change at the university of the president and, and my provincial called and asked if I would be open to being nominated to be the president. It's like, Oh Lord, you duped me. And I let myself be duped, but, <laughs> but the rest is history. So how did that go down? Oh yeah. 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 So, um, well, it was funny cause I was traveling full time doing kind of itinerant preaching and mm-hmm. mentoring preaching. And, uh, my provincial calls me and he said, Dave, you know, um, the university is going to be looking for a new president. And I'm wondering if you'd be open to allowing me to submit your name. Cause that's how that works with obedience and all that. Yeah. And honestly, what I said to him, I said, uh, I said, Father Malachi, I've not been in a meeting for eight years. <laughs> and he and said, I do uh, not intend to start now. He said, your life's about to change. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it, it's interesting because I worked with Father Mike for his last two years as president. Mm. And, um, it was, it was one of those things that, that people had talked to over the year. Gee, I wonder if Father David would be present. But there were almost, there came to this point, well, that maybe that wasn't mine to do. I was involved in some ministry that I'd, I'd been working on and with the wild goose and traveling and all that. And, uh, but, you know, I, I remember just praying about it and, and ultimately, Lord, your will be done. That's one of the things that I love about my life is that rarely does an individual discern something by themselves but that we've got my province, my community. And then with this, the board of trustees and the university that discerned this and came to that place where, yeah, they felt felt that it's what God wanted me to do. So I know we don't want to base our success on other people's opinions. That's a really bad idea, especially if you're on YouTube and start reading the comment section. I don't do that anymore, but everybody is so thrilled who I talk to. Like everybody who works at the university, just all, I'll say how it was like a breath of fresh air when you came in. It's been a great blessing. (sighs) Yeah. yeah. Wow. So did the TORs, I don't know much about this particular order. When I was mm-hmm. discerning priesthood, I was looking in the Capuchins mm-hmm. and then I looked mm-hmm. at the CFRs because mm-hmm. they seem super hardcore yeah, yeah. and I probably would have lasted there a week. Yeah. But but did the TORs go through a sort of crazy period in the 70s or whatever? Or Yeah. Well, first off, just to, to maybe shed some light on that, that, that Francis started three orders. So I like to joke that it took Francis three times to get it right. So he, he did? Yeah. What does yeah. that mean? That's what I'm going to tell you. Okay. Patience, my brother. <laughs> so Francis Francis has a conversion, and uh, and then he, he becomes a part of what's kind of like an RCIA group, the Order of Penitents. So it was, if you've had notorious sinners they, in the early church, this would have been in the late 1100s, uh, is part of this group called the Order of Penitents, uh, and it was a time of reparation and, and penance and that kind of thing. So then Francis, since we all know the story, he's in front of the San Domingo Cross, rebuild my church. So he begins to rebuild the church. He sends, the Lord sends him brothers that begin to do that. Then he started the second order, which is the poor clares. Mm-hmm. And then um, 
that what he was seeing is that the first order is largely mendicant moving all around mm -hmm. and he wants to start a community that's going to stay kind of settled and in where they are and bring about transformation of, i didn't realize that. yeah so what he did is he went back to that those group of friends that he had that were the order of penitents and he started the franciscan friars of the third order regular of penance so our full name is franciscan friars of the third order regular no penance. way but the thought was is and it's really one of those there's a couple of distinguishing things between the third order and the first order and that is one of them is actually the way we view poverty is that the first order is without property. This, the third order would be the right use of property because Franciscan third order were always involved in healthcare, hospitals, and education. Mm. So it wasn't realistic of you being able to do your ministry without things, without stuff, without books. I mean, there's a huge debate in the early mm -hmm. Franciscan, should you have books? Well, the third order, if you're going to be educators, you've got to have books. So that, so what you see, and again, this is so simplistic, but what you see in the first order over the centuries is one of splitting. And it's largely, not always, but largely about poverty. What does it look like to live poverty in the 1100s, in the 1200s, the 1400s, the 1800s? So you see these multiple splits. So in the late part of the 18, around 1890 something, seven maybe, there was all kinds of first order Franciscans just, and they have what's now called the Leonine Union, the, that all the friars had to come about. You have to be either OFM, an OFM conventual hmm. or OFM Capuchin. But even in that, so the CFRs was a split from the OFM Capuchins mm -hmm. about what does it look like to live poverty and live, be faithful to the gospel, be faithful. So whereas the first order, you see more of that, you don't see a lot of that in the third order. There's just kind of a difference uh, of, of the focus of the ministry and how we live our life. Now, back to your point. Honestly, my community's always been, I mean, it's been pretty straight down the middle. I mean, it's not not extreme on necessarily the the liberal side or not extreme less or the conservative side and it's actually one of the reasons i i was drawn to the community was one of my concerns was was i able to be myself mm -hmm. right um i visited some groups it was kind of cookie cutter they all look the same they all kind of the same mm -hmm. and, and that just that's just not me. A, cindy wilker said if you've met one you probably heard this yeah. if you've met one francis contoi you've met one francis yeah, 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 you met one y'all were very different all, yeah. that's true but i i appreciate that that's good and, and my thought was um they were seeking to be holy but that doesn't always look exactly the same you know so i felt that i could live the life that the lord was calling me to and i could be faithful to that and you know, it was, it's been a good and good has your me. order uh, been influenced by the renewal or is it just this order in this part of the country around franciscan or yeah i would say across the board that percentage wise my community has been more impacted by the renewal partly because of franciscan university i mean mm. a lot of our vocations come through the university ask, yeah. yeah yeah so I, I would say probably more than some i wanted to ask you about having jordan peterson on campus yeah, yeah, yeah. how that came about and yeah, it was really it was really a wonderful experience. How it came about was uh, an individual who's a supporter of the university said, "Is this something you would be even be open to?" And mm. I said, "Sure, I would. I would be open to that." But I also knew that it would be difficult to get him to find a schedule that would work. Yeah, um, it's expensive. Mm -hmm. A lot, a lot that went into that. So I said, "Let's just begin to look and see what if it's possible." And honestly, Matt, everything just kind of fell into place. And and it, there there was a. The process of us being vetted, like, was he willing to come to us, was fairly extensive. Really? I had asked him about that because he <clears throat> basically doesn't visit college campuses anymore. He, he says it's just, it's just a minefield. In fact, it's interesting. He would state that when you take a look at the whole world of wokeism and, and what's going on in the culture, he would lay that at the feet of a higher education. Mm -hmm. He said it's just such a train wreck. And, and we're not about educating that higher education is largely about creating activists. Mm -hmm. And so, but they've edited us and they looked at us and they say, okay, there seems to be something different about this school. So obviously he, he ended up coming. It was funny though, because when we, we were told ahead of time that he was going to come to the university, but as soon as he came to town, we, we picked him up at around 8.30 in the morning. He, he's going to go directly to his hotel. Does he, he must have a private plane. There's um, no way he's boarding. Yeah, this was a private plane. Good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can you imagine? <laughs> yeah, no, I can't. No, I can't. Like, but, you're, you're the president of Franciscan. I'm sure you get stopped at airports occasionally. Can you yeah. imagine? Oh, yeah, Jordan yeah, Peterson? yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I don't know how he always flies, but again, we had a donor who, mm. who helped out with that, which I was profoundly grateful. But we pick him up and he said, okay, well, what's the plan? I said, well, we were told you want to go back to your hotel. He goes, he goes no. He goes, if I go back to my hotel, I'm just going to sleep the whole mm. time. 
So I said, we'd love to show you around the university. And it was fantastic. We, he walked around with us for about an hour and a half. It was all, it was just really beautiful. And that like we walked by one of our residence hall is Colby Clare. And he'd never heard the story of Maximilian Colby. So it was wow. really, really cool yes. to tell. I had this experience when I, I worked in China a number of times with the underground church. And mm. to be able to tell the story of Maximilian Colby to somebody who's never heard the story of Maximilian <laughs> Colby was really cool. And it was really very moved by that. Took him to the Port Sianculo, which mm-hmm. the Port Sianculo is a small chapel now, You're on probably campus. about to, but please embell. I really want you to focus on this point. Oh, okay. Because this is one okay. of the best responses to. Okay, now now I feel like I'm going to mess it up. Well, okay. just don't. Okay, don't? Yeah, just okay. don't mess it up. All right, correct Good. me if, correct me if oh, I, I do. Oh, I don't know. Okay. I, I only know it because I heard you yeah. tell it yeah, yeah. in a homily. Yeah, no. But um, so we were going down and I was trying to explain to him what he was going to see. And uh, I said, okay, that we as Catholics believe that that we have adoration. We You're going to see a monster. I tried to put in his mind what he was going to see. I said, you're going to see kids kneeling down. And I said, we believe that Jesus is present in the Eucharist. And it's not just a symbol. And he said, well, what's wrong with a symbol? And I said, well, I would rather have you with me here than just a symbol. And he said, ah, that makes sense. <laughs> Yeah. What a great answer. Yeah, and it was just it was just one of those You know how bug you know how angry I would be if I <laughs> finally went to see Jordan Peterson and it was a hologram? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, right? Right. Yeah. Or a video or something like you that. Are you kidding exactly. me? Yeah. And so, you said what's wrong with the symbol? Wouldn't be happy. Yeah, yeah. He and he, he said, Oh, that makes sense. So he he went into the blessed he went into the Porti and um he said that he said there's a sense of peace. There's a sense of calm there. We yeah. invited him to liturgy. I think you were, were you at mass that day. I wasn't, but I my understanding is this was the very first holy mass he has ever He's attended ever at Franciscan University. Right, right. No, ever period, obviously, and he attended at Franciscan University. Right, he'd yeah. never been to mass before. Yeah, and he's actually spoke of it several times. People have have reached out to me. He was at a. He went up to Akron a couple of days later, probably three or four or five times over the last many months. He's talked about his experience at Francis University. But it was it was remarkable. He sat in the front row. I mean, it was really, as you know. It, Were it, you celebrating Holy I was. Mass? I was. It was, <laughs> was everybody it was more packed. interested in Jordan than the Blessed Eucharist? Or no, what? no, brother. They were more interested in the Eucharist. That's why we were there. People were very like, that. they were whispering. It's like, because <laughs> he sat in the front row. And he's like, I guess this is what happens at Holy Mass. People just whisper a yeah. lot and look at you. You no. know, though, he, he watched with an intensity and paid attention with intensity that was just really moving. Were you and, trying not to stare? Well, I mean, he was right in my face. Were you I'm trying not to direct your homily at him about converting? maybe slipped in a word or two, <laughs> but let me just say a point to that point, Matt. It was really interesting because we talked about this ahead of time. Um, he, he shared with me, I mean, in essence, he shared it's hard being me. It's, you know, he said, I said, what's this like? He said, I want my life back, mm. you know? And the other thing he shared is that he feels like a piece of meat. Like who's going to win that's the prize. Right. Like we just want him on our team. We right. don't really care about the truth, but right. just, Right, and that's exactly man. what I said to my team here. I said, yeah. our job is to welcome him, to care for him, to be hospitable to him, and let the Lord work out the rest, you know? And he said, the Muslim community wants me, the evangelical community wants me, the Catholic community wants me. Mm-hmm. Um, but but now we also knew that that his wife, that the Lord is doing something in his wife, and she has a devotion to the rosary. And big thanks, to shout out to Bishop Robert Barron. Yeah, He's yeah, been open yeah, about that, yeah. that it's his... Bishop Robert Barron's videos that are kind of ins- have inspired her to pray the day of right. the rosary. So it was interesting when he was on the phone talking with his wife and and said, um, "You need to come and see this place." He said that, that, that there's just something different about this place, and it was really really beautiful. And and I actually, Matt, I'll, I must say, uh, I appreciate your text at the end of the night. I was going to bring that up. Yeah, I really did appreciate that. It was um, it was funny because going into it, everyone's saying, "Are you nervous? Are you scared?" Because he gave a talk for about an hour, and then he and I talked for about an hour, and they said, yes. "Are you nervous? Are you scared?" It's like, well, I wasn't until everybody started <laughs> saying, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I thought it went. I thought it went quite beautifully. Yeah, like, yeah. I'm going to see if I can pull up that uh, that text message that I sent you here. Goodness knows. No, I don't know if I have it. It's because I keep changing phones. But I'll tell you what I loved about it right now. Oh, you have it. I don't know if I do or not. Let's look it up. Yeah, that interview is, in my opinion, way better than that. Did you go, Neil? No. No, I don't have it. I've got here, I've got (coughs) Matt Frad, too. So you must have had several (laughs) different phone numbers. phone in August, that's why. No, here's what I loved about it. All right, if I was in your shoes, whew. 
Here, here's the mistake, all the mistakes I would have made, I think. Okay. <laughs> I would have tried to match his psycho babble jargon. See, I'm not, I knew I, I couldn't do that. I'm not saying it's yeah. jar, I'm not saying yeah, he's yeah, yeah. a, a windbag. He's terrific and insightful and intelligent and wonderful. But I, you know, number one, I could say that would be one flaw. You, you just try to match him with that and impress him. Uh, number two, you just let him talk the whole time or you just you you talk too much. Or you just get too preachy and kind of it gets weird. Mm -hmm. You did the perfect balance. You just you you proclaim the gospel to mm -hmm. him simply and beautifully. Thank you, man. And it never got weird. It never That's got awesome. cringe That's at awesome. all. That's cool. Yeah, I was so proud That's of you. That's cool. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, I, I, I enjoyed <clears> it. I appreciate it. It's, but it does speak to like when I was hired at the university, part of the interview process. I said, "Um, you're hiring a priest." You're hiring a shepherd, you're hiring a father, you're hiring a pastor. And I said, I'm, if you want the best administrator, that's probably not me. But if you want to hire somebody who wants to shepherd a community, who wants to care for a community, who wants to challenge a community, I said the very, one of the first things I said is a father, any father is going to say some things that the kids don't want to hear. Mm -hmm. And I said, but I'm going to try to love you enough that I'm going to continue to do that. So that's what I tried to do. I just tried to have a conversation as somebody who cared for him. And mm -hmm. yeah, so that's great. Thanks. How did it, how did it wrap up? Because I mean, he waves and people cheer and go off the stage. Did he head back that night? Or yeah, he did. He did. Yeah, he yeah actually he spent the night and then he left the next morning. And we're at we're having a little bit more dialogue to see if there's something more that we could do to work together. And uh, but again, his world is and why is he, he so popular right now? That's a great question, and it's interesting. I need to nuance this. One of the things that I appreciated when I first started listening to him, honestly, and again, I'll nuance this, was that it wasn't necessarily from a faith perspective. Mm -hmm. It was uh, from a psychological perspective that I thought was was good. It was balanced. It was common sense. Um, it was reasoned. Mm -hmm. uh, it was articulate. It was passionate. Um, now, obviously, I, I want him to come to faith. I want that for him and for, for the goodness of him. But Sometimes people will say, well, you, you believe that because you're Catholic. You believe that. Mm -hmm. But so I, I actually appreciated that. Um, but I think he speaks common sense. Um, I don't know. He yeah, also he speaks to I light, think in the Christian clarity. world, maybe why he's popular is he's saying a lot of the things that we believe that we've forgotten about. Yeah. But he says them differently enough that you're like, oh, something yeah. new about it. Yeah. I like, think for example, fair. I did a video recently on what Jordan Peterson has to say about cohabitation. Mm -hmm. And I was like. Kind of angry because we've been saying this forever. Yeah, no yeah, one yeah. listens to yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. And then Jordan, Jordan Peterson, he's so. really down on cohabitation. Yeah, and the yeah, way yeah. he explains it yeah. is just so fresh and beautiful. I also heard somebody say that maybe what Christians are receiving today is a spiritual formation, but not a human formation. Mm -hmm. And so good. maybe they're kind of that's stunned good. by yeah, the those two things. That's a good insight. Neil, do we have do we have that video for a break? And then we can come back and take some questions or is that? Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> What video not the one with the ads. Oh, the we ads. We're doing ad reads that we need to do, but we have uh, the music one. All right, I'll do the ad reads right now. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Number one, Hello is the best meditation and prayer app on the web today. Have you heard of Hello? I have. It's really good. Yeah, he's going to be with us. Alex, Alex? going to be with us. I had Alex in studio. He's amazing. Yeah. So he's yeah. a convert from, yeah. I don't know about Buddhism, but New Age stuff. And he was listening to New Age apps on how to meditate. And when he became Catholic, to so, and I know you know this, I'm telling them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, can tell, yeah. I can tell you too. Yeah. But yeah, he's like, we need to have something. I'll tell you right now, Hallow is way better than the other apps he referred to me too like calm and these other ones so i want to recommend people go right now click the link in the description below hello.com slash matt frad hello.com slash matt frad <laughs> you can have scott hahn read to you at night mm -hmm. and then you yeah. see him in the morning and feel very awkward yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. but uh yeah they'll lead you through the rosary they've got beautiful books sister M uh, miriam james do do you have anything on there well, we're actually we're recording next week are you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Alex How, is coming in, yeah. H-A-L-L-O-W dot com slash Matt Frag. Go yeah, and check them out. Franciscan University is one of the corporate sponsors with them. We, I love what Hal is doing, and, and yeah. we've been part of that for a while. Yeah, yeah, they're really faithful to the church. In fact, Jordan Peterson just interviewed Peter Kraft, mm -hmm. 
like I told you. And about 15 I minutes in. I need to go watch that. And about 15 minutes in, Halo starts getting advertised. I'm like, I need to charge them more. Because <laughs> that must not. <laughs> but then I do not have the reach he does. But oh. anyway, halo.com slash Matt Frag. Go and download. But here's the thing. If you go to that URL instead of just downloading it from their website, you'll get three months for free. <laughs> so you can try it out for three months if you really like it. It's so funny. Like you go into the Adoration Chapel today and you see people with earphones and you know what they're doing. Yeah. yeah. They're listening to Led Zeppelin. Yeah, All right. Yeah. Second thing I want to tell people about is Exodus 90. Exodus 90, correct me, Neil, dot com slash Matt. Mm-hmm. You done Exodus ninety? No, I've it's done brutal. It. Yeah, yeah. I hate it so much. <laughs> and even though I'm advertising it, probably won't do it again. But they have a twenty one day challenge, which is significant. It's a little bit doable. Yeah, yeah. and it, there's different things to it. For example, you have to fast until three o'clock every day uh, on all weekdays. Okay, so there's okay. different different elements in it. They've got a really sophisticated app that connects you with a brotherhood. So Exodus ninety is an ascetical program for men. Check them out, exodus90.com slash Matt, is that it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, link in the description. Click the link in the description below and check it out if you want to jumpstart your spiritual life, if you're feeling sluggish, if you want to, you know, you know that there's more and you've just been dragging your feet. Go, go look at their website and see the different programs they offer because uh, it's bloody hard, but people who've done it say it's really great. Cold showers? Yep. You know, uh, you know what I found I was doing? I'd, no, no, not the not the twenty one days. Okay, okay, twenty one okay. days. You can have alcohol. Oh, you can have, <laughs> that sounds like my kind. You can of have asceticism. marijuana. You can yeah. no, no. Oh. But they never specify. But I'm just joking. But um, that was a bad joke. Sorry. Uh, you, you, but yeah, you you, you can have warm showers, alcohol. Okay. Right. But there's a lot of other things okay. that make it difficult, but doable. Um, but I found the cold showers difficult when I did Exodus ninety, and I would actually find them like it's been. Two days and I haven't had a shower. Yeah, this, yeah this that's isn't, right. Your wife's saying, good. honey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or I'd be in the shower just shouting out the names of people I was offering it up yeah, for. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. That's awesome. Anyway. Cool. Terrific. Do we want to go on break? No. Uh, <laughs> the, the, let's be honest. The only reason I ever have a break is I have a video that plays those ads. So okay. I'd have to read them awkwardly in front of my guests. Okay. Right. Let's keep going. Yeah. So what's on the horizon for you? Uh, what's on the horizon? Um, well, yeah, you mentioned, we talked a little bit about the Wild Goose, but I'm really kind yeah. of excited about, well, Tell me ju- about yeah, that. just what that is, is um, Wild Goose was, I wrote a book on what I call Breath of God. Okay. And my, my, yeah, what really motivated that again was back to the conversation we had about Pentecost and the Holy Spirit and baptism of the Holy Spirit is that um, if, if I believe that if we're going to grow in the spiritual life, we need the presence of, of the Holy Spirit in our life. It's just, it's not... It's not an option. Now, one of the things that make this distinction is that is that we need the spirit of Jesus, whether or not a person's involved in the charismatic renewal as a movement, uh, whatever, fine. If you want to be part of that, great. But, well, and, and this is interesting because one of the things that I see is that there are some people who dismiss relationship with the Holy Spirit because they say, oh, that's charismatic. I don't want to have anything to do with that, which is ludicrous. I mean, <laughs> Jesus literally says that I have come to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. I mean, John says I've come baptize you in water, one will come greater than I will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, go to Jerusalem, wait for the promise of the Father, you'll see the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So we need that Holy Spirit. But what I was finding as I was traveling all the time is is looking around and it's the same story that Aquinas, Aquinas is looking out at his students and he says, how is it possible that that they've been baptized and confirmed and re- receive Eucharist, but they don't seem to be living a dynamic faith life? And he talks about that the spirit is in one sense, it's dormant. It's, it's mm. asleep in us and something needs to awaken that. So uh, yeah, I, I, I did a book called Breath of God, uh, but I also was c- highly cognizant of the reality that some people aren't gonna read. So I wanted to create something that would be more visual, that'd be more artistic, that would be beautiful. And we mm. did the, the wild goose. The wild goose was a term for the Holy Spirit by the ancient Celts. Huh. I love the image. I love the image, right? It's not it's not a domesticated dove that you put in a in a cage, but there's a wildness to a goose that, that I thought was... Huh. And if you pay attention, when you hear that and you look at some of the art in various churches, you'll see these images that you weren't even aware of it. Is that how does that relate to? I want to be careful here, but wild goose chase is that completely separate? Yeah, the, the, is the website or there, no? No, a you phrase, a wild the, goose chase. Oh, is, I, I don't know. That's a good question. Find out. Google that. Yeah, I'll Google it. Yeah. When, when did you uh, do this uh, program? These videos? Yeah, 2016. Because I saw some of them was really impressed at the quality. Yeah, they're really really beautiful. Who did that? Uh, 4 p.m. Media. Yeah. yeah um, Dan Johnson, graduate of the university, okay. and married he and his wife. Um, 
But that's one of the things we wanted, honestly, is, is a couple of things we wanted to do. One, we wanted to make it beautiful. You know, too often times we just kind of put up a camera and hmm. film something. We wanted it to be beautiful. The, the beauty of the what you're seeing and experiencing. Uh, we also wanted to make it available for free. You know, that we didn't, we, we wanted to make it available to as many people as possible. So that was our marketing plan. People came to us and said, oh, you guys, marketing plan was genius. <laughs> it's like, we didn't have a marketing plan, right? Um, but yeah, from that, then uh, we did a, a follow-up to that called Metanoia and, and what we're working, was is really focusing on Jesus. And what we're working on now is, uh, through that is the Father. Um, just you know, over the last couple of years, just really being convinced that, that we've got a struggle in the church today with uh, men and women really believing that they've got a father that loves them and mm. a father that wants to father them and be present to them. And again, I think it goes to some of the issues we have earlier that the, the one of the tactics of the evil one is to break down the family, break down fatherhood, mm. and, and that needs to be highlighted and restored. So on a personal, that's I'm working on some of that. And then the university, we are celebrating our 75th anniversary, which has been fantastic. One thing I've noticed, and I wonder what you think about this, is it seems like the charismatics are becoming more traditional over the years. And may, maybe I'm wrong in that assessment, but it would just seem to me, let me just kind of play this out. I got a few thoughts on this, yeah, right? So yeah. it's like, um, I know that's kind of true of me. I know that's true of many others. And it's not as if they've left the charismatic thing behind, mm -hmm. but there just seems to be this new love and appreciation of the liturgy and of... Um, yeah, yeah, kind of traditional prayer in, in general. And I don't know, I, maybe it's that the kind of charismatic era within the church was unfairly associated with some of the unfortunate innovations that took place. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. our cigar lounge that we're starting down here on 4th mm -hmm. Street, we had to rip through dumb dry uh, drop ceiling and shag carpet. And someone's like, who would do this? And I said, I guess the same guy who came up with liturgical abuse. <laughs> so they thought this would be fun. And yeah, it really, yeah, really, yeah. really, really wasn't. Um, so I, I guess that might be one question. Yeah. Well, I think, I think there is some truth to that okay. is, is that they, there has been seeing that and seeing some of the individuals that, that I know that have moved towards that. But one of the things that I would say, I remember, having this conversation that, that I don't believe the two are mutually exclusive. Okay. You know, I don't think that there are, there's, I think the evil one. Yeah. How could, how could they possibly be a beautiful liturgy and like worshiping in the Holy spirit? Yeah. Yeah. No. And, and the evil one would desire today's the feast of the archangels. And mm -hmm. it talks about the evil one to, the, being the, the, the liar and the device of, and obviously Michael comes in and kicks his butt. Um, so, so I think that's something that's important. But one, somebody said to me one time, I was doing an interview, and they said, is it possible that Franciscan University could be a place where you can pray in Latin and pray in tongues? Is that is actually, is it possible that those worlds could actually live together? And I think it is. It is possible for that. And part of it is, you're right, I think a, a longing for the, the, the transcendent, mm -hmm. um, for the beauty. Yeah. I think in a time of kind of what do they call it, like liquid modernity where – we have no history and we don't belong to anything. There's this desire to recover the beauty of Catholicism. Mm -hmm. But no, it is, it is really cool. Like I, I never went well, to... I mean, what's more traditional than Pentecost? Yeah. Right, right. We celebrate the birthday of the church is Pentecost, is it not? It's, and, yeah. and I think that there needs to be an awareness of that and, yeah. and a recognition of that. Having not been from here, I don't know the history of the place, as I said earlier, but one thing I found really interesting is, yeah, you have these beautiful praise and worship nights, but then when I go to daily mass, you also see these Sheilas and Mantias and kneeling yeah, down to yeah, receive Eucharist. Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's, it's, it's a church. Again, my, my concern is that when... The, the evil one and we, we unfortunately too often times participate with that. We create these divisions that yeah. don't need to exist. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. So I've got some questions here, which I haven't gone through, I haven't read through yet. Okay. So we'll see. Come from our local supporters. Dun, dun, dun. So, okay. People are watching this live. Right yeah. Now. We okay. have 427 people watching right now. All right. Cool. What's Before the... we do that, the wild goose chase Googling was oh, inconclusive. Yeah. So <laughs> there you go. There you go. It's unclear where the term comes from. And uh, the wild goose uh, Holy Spirit um, is from the early church. And also right. there was a sacking of Rome that was attempted. I think it was Rome mm -hmm. where the as the Gauls were coming in, the geese were making a lot of noise. So it woke all the soldiers up. So oh, how cool. It's like a vigilance thing. Yeah. Too. 
you concur? I do. That? I do. That's absolutely right. They actually call it. So now, some people confuse it, confuse it with gray goose. The vodka. vodka. Different which, Yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> so. uh, Graceful Catholic says, what's the best way to encourage our children to discern religious life versus technical college versus mainstream college? That's a good question. Um, well, I guess the... Just, yeah, the big question is it relates to discernment. Um, authentic discernment is always between two goods. And that's important that we recognize that, that, that I don't have to discern between whether or not I should be a priest or I should be a drug dealer in Vegas, right? So it's always between two goods. And to that end, um, the Lord desires to fulfill the deepest desire of our hearts. Psalm, Psalm speak of. Uh, interesting. St. Saint John Vianney said, the Lord delights in doing the will of those who love mm-hmm. him, which seems to be opposite of what we would think. But so part of that is, what is the deepest desire of the, of the heart of, of your son or daughter? And, and really being able to help them walk through that and, and discover that. Now, for me, that, that takes a while. Like, I, as I mentioned earlier, I, as a fairly young age, I thought about maybe the Lord was calling me to be a priest, but I also dated, you know, I had girlfriends. And so the heart is fickle. I remember being back at the university as a student writing in my journal, you know, Lord, I'm so grateful that now I understand that I'm called to be a uh, called to get married. Well, I also had this huge crush on this girl, right? So the, the, the discernment takes time because our heart is, there's secrets of our heart that we don't know. So I think that's part of it is, is what is the deepest desire of the heart of the individual? And that, that needs to be with, with spiritual direction and with counsel, because if we merely follow our heart in this, like whatever my heart says, that's not what I'm saying. It's, it's that deepest desire because the deepest desire of my heart is where the Lord dwells. So to be able to discover that. So that's the first point is that is that the Lord is inviting us to follow him and be faithful to him. You know, and again, part of it is I'm going to probably pay for this, but I don't think necessarily everybody's called to university. You know, I don't think everybody's called to get a degree. And and what is it that, that they ultimately are, are going to be about being the person that God created them to be, be about participating in the kingdom and the building of the kingdom of God and something that that's life giving, you know, so for some, that's going to be university for others. It's not going to be university. Now, as it relates to relate and she didn't necessarily, it's a, she was it she, yes, so she didn't necessarily say this, but I think that one of the things that uh, having dealt with young people for a lot, when they're discerning whether or not to be a religious or discerning to be married, it's interesting because I think sometimes they focus more on, the ends rather than the process of, of getting there. And mm. so the, the one piece of advice I always give is, is first off discern whether or not you're called to be celibate. Because if you're not called to be celibate, you're not called to be a priest, right? So if you're, if you sense that you're being called to be celibate, okay, Lord, how am I supposed to live that celibacy out? And that's a whole nother. Whole yeah. I was, I was going to ask you that question where, I mean, there's, there's a lot of people today who are like, why, why would I send my kids to university? Not just because of the woke mm-hmm. influence, but just because, there are other things that they could be doing and it feels like America has, it feels like in America, people think if I don't go to university, then there's something wrong with me, which in Australia, it's not like that. People go yeah. get a trade. Yeah, they go yeah, do yeah. something useful with yeah, their lives. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's actually important. Well, first off, there's, there's the education and the degree, depending on what person's called to, as far as the work and the ministry that they're involved in. There's also the, which for me was so important was just the formation, the human formation, the spiritual formation, the social formation that takes place in those four years from 18. It's interesting. Studies say that from these are kids that are actively going to church by the time when they're 18, by the time they're 23, 70% are not going to church anymore. Those years are profoundly important. Um, and, And I think that choosing no matter where you do, but being very intentional about that choosing an area and a place in transition that's going to help support your faith. You know, yeah. I think is, is really, no, really you're key. exactly right. I mean, the formation that you get at a school like Franciscan is, is huge. We yeah, already talked yeah, about that, yeah. the peer pressure to be a saint. Yeah. Um, Emma asks, how can lay 21st century Americans better imitate St. Francis's example? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, one of the things Francis would go on to say, so the Lord invited me to live penance and to preach penance. So if you read Francis's text, he's, he's often talking about penance. But for him, what we think of penance is like a singular thing. We go to confession, we do our penance. For, for Francis, it was, it was a way of life. It was a way of living. So what does that look like for the person today? Francis would say there were five elements to it. Um, first off, love God. 
love him and, and give your heart to him, put him in the center of your life. The next, he said, would love your neighbor, love that individual, love the leper, the person that just drives you crazy and batty. Mm. Uh, the next he would say is there needs to be hatred of sin. We live in a world today that largely doesn't talk about sin and, mm. and uh, to our demise, honestly. So Francis said there needs to be hatred of sin. The next, he said, frequent reception of the sacraments, particularly Eucharist and confession, and participating in that and living that. And then the last, the fifth element of living penance that Francis would say was living a life worthy of uh, producing of penance, of uh, works of penance, uh, works of mercy, outreach to the poor, evangelization, catechesis, those things. So those five elements are in the mm. life of the individual. Yeah. That's great. But the other thing that's really important, and again, Francis, have you been to Assisi? I have. Okay. So the Umbrian Valley, you're standing up or looking over the uh, valley. This was back in 2000 and I wasn't yet really a Christian, <laughs> yeah. at it's least a practicing one. So I don't remember a lot of it. It's beautiful. So Assisi uh, is kind of built up on a hill and he's mm -hmm. overlooking the Umbrian Valley. And this is, for, um, religious life is fundamentally different after the time of Francis. And he said, the world is going to be my cloister. And he said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to build a wall around the friars that separates us from the people. Um, and, and that's that's the nature of the incarnation is, is that God enters the messiness. And that's what uh, that's key for Franciscan Friends Franciscan University is that we, we want to engage the world. We want to graduate men and women that are going to go and they're going to become incarnational to the world. So that was key for Francis as well, is that you need to be able to engage the world to bring about transformation. Transformation is going to happen out from the inside. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jonah Peace says, what's the best way that young Catholic families can interact with Franciscan University and the Steubenville community from other parts of the country? My husband and I are in Alaska raising young children. We are not alumni, but have watched Father Dave's interviews and classes. It's interesting. I don't know what's going on in Alaska. I think we have got five or six freshmen from Alaska. This really? Year. It's crazy. Yeah. Uh, well, first off, yeah, we, we do a lot that, that's offered online, but one of the great outreaches of the university is our conferences. So yeah. every summer we've got, for youth conferences, we've got about 25 conferences around the country. You've spoke for us, obviously. But how uh, many you know. people go to these 25 youth conferences? Well, Bullpark. BC before, <laughs> before COVID, about 60,000. Remarkable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the other is that, you know, coming to near you is, uh, but the other thing that we're, we're doing that's really exciting, this could actually be something that could be possible for uh, someone in Alaska is we're providing parish missions is that, and you would appreciate this, that there is, there is a, a really, I think, important ministry, it's called them. Um, event type ministry where we come to a parish in a community and we put on a, a mission. So if that's something you could be interested in, you could reach out to our outreach office and, and we'd love to be able to do something like that for you. With that being said, Alaska is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. I've heard that. It's just stunningly beautiful. Yeah. Uh, Interior Castle One says, where in the UK do you know of any way my daughter can get a Catholic university education in the UK, Europe without having to move to the US? I went to Marivale Institute in Birmingham, England. Is that graduate school or is it undergraduate? That's both. Is it? Yeah, that's both. So I did a lot of my undergraduate there and that uh, Cardinal John Henry Newman, Cardinal Saint John Henry Newman. Um, yeah, his his room was right above the chapel there. Yeah. His kneeler is there and... So that's yeah. one idea. Yeah, honestly, I'm not I'm not that familiar. That that's certainly one. I'm not familiar Yo. with a lot of others. We do offer an online yeah. program in a couple of in a couple of areas, theology, philosophy, business. Undergrad or both? Undergraduate and both and, and Matt, graduate. Can someone right? get a theology degree undergrad? They can. Distance? They can. Yeah. Our our preference is that um, because education is formation, so it's not the area that we necessarily want to go um as as a full board. You know, I think education, especially 18 to 20 and 18 to 25. Being together, being around each other is really, really important. But that's something that's available to the students. In fact, I think we've got 1,100 online students this year. That's so more terrific. and more people are taking an opportunity for that. You tell me when you got to go, okay? I don't want to keep okay, you. Okay, all right. Yeah. Patrick Lord says, fully embracing their Catholic identity has been beneficial for Franciscans. So why don't more Catholic universities do the same? I can't speak to that. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I could make up some reasons, but I don't know. Um, we've touched this, but if you want to take another swing at it, feel free. It comes from Mary Beth. Hi, Matt. Curious if the university has faced, has been faced with any woke students who push transgender and critical race ideologies. I realize the students there are primarily conservative, but have they dealt with this? What is their stand on these topics? With, uh, yeah, you know. I mean, we do. We, we've, we've got young people that are wrestling with that. We've got 
Yeah, I mean, it's 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 foolish to say that that the kids aren't there. But again, and, and we honestly, I don't think we necessarily answer the question well. I mean, my same desire for them, for kids who are struggling with that, is the same that I have for anybody, and that that's that they come to know Jesus and they come to know His love and come to know His healing and come to know His mercy and His freedom. So that's uh, that's how I want to treat all of our kids. Um, I would like to mm. say that you know that, that if you're struggling with these that Francis University is the best place because there you're going to find a community that's going to love you but love you in truth you know not not just love isn't just I, one of the things that drives me crazy Matt is this this um love is love all love is the same it's not all love is not the same I've had too many people come into my office that have been forced to do things in the name of love right all love is not the same and and I and I I, I've been loved by the Lord and I've been loved by other people and, and I know it's not the same. But my hope and my desire is that we can have an environment where young people can mm-hmm. can wrestle with this and, and really ask honest questions. I think the reality is, is that maybe sometimes at the university it's, it's the opposite is kids are afraid to admit that. They're afraid to say, you know, I struggle with this. It's, you know, kids will come to me and they said, you know, again, because everything they've been told for 18 years is one thing that say, Father Dave, I just don't understand what the church is saying. I don't, it doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't seem nice as Jesus is loving what he really asked. I remember somebody said to me, actually, this was a really beautiful encounter I had with a young man at the university. He went to the movie, um, Lord of the Rings. And I, I'm, I'm, you're, you're going to have to forgive me. I'm, not a huge student of Lord of the Rings. Um, Fro- Fro- Frodo, um, Frodo, Frodo, Frodo. Thank you. He's the one with the ring, correct? Yeah. I, yeah. Tons of judgment coming yes, your way. I, know, I didn't I know, think I, I was going to judge I you as harshly as I currently I, am. I felt it, Frodo. I felt it coming across <laughs> right now. As soon as I said this, it's yeah, like, yeah, I yeah. know this All is right. not good. Um, so the young guy was in my office, and um, he he struggled with with uh, same sex attractions. Mm-hmm. And he said, Father Dave, I I watched this movie and I was just like weeping. It's like, what's going on? Mm. And he said, "Uh, the ring. He said, I know what that's like. He said, I didn't ask for this. I didn't want it. But I can't. Yeah. And it was so good for, I think, for him to admit that and to talk about it, but also for me to hear that because there's a way sometimes, and it's because of the activism, we had this idea of what somebody looks like. That's yep. right. But this was this was a 19-year-old kid that was so honest and so real and said, I didn't ask for this. I don't want this. And awesome. I can't seem to get rid of it. Right. But the reality is, and honestly, Matt, uh, amongst people with faith on us, that they're, they're not going to come because they've experienced judgment. Like you just judged yeah, me for the record. That's right. You don't um, want to go watch Lord of the Rings yeah, now. Seriously. Please. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I, my, my hope is, and that's one of the things I'm really proud of the Inagratis program is that, is that we, we create an environment where, where young people can ask the question and, and without condemnation, without mm. judgment and saying, I just need, and that's what I hope we're doing. Yeah. We, we we have Orlando. I see that super chat there, which I want to read, but I got a story. One of the most beautiful things uh, that ever happened to me at these Franciscan youth conferences, mm-hmm. if you don't mind, I was giving a talk on pornography. I guess that was one of the main themes of this particular conference a few years ago. Mm-hmm. And I made, I've been speaking about this for so long and I always make a deal, uh, make a point in saying that, you know, men struggle with pornography, women struggle with pornography. You know, for women, it's so difficult. I, Audrey Assad once said that men struggle but at least they're all in the same prison cell together that's what it's like mm. she said for us women it's like we're in solitary confinement and we don't believe anybody yeah, else yeah. has ever struggled with this <laughs> so i give this talk right and it's saturday night and it's the beautiful prayer sure, thing sure, sure. But it's beautiful and all i want to do is go back to the hotel and go to bed because mm. i'm tired and i wasn't feeling any of the nice yeah, things yeah, yeah. that you should feel or do not should feel but sometimes feel and so i was standing there wondering if i should just duck out for the night and this woman comes up to me in the dark you know and, hey what's up and I could tell that something was up because she'd been mm-hmm. crying. So I was going to try to redirect her to one of the female team members, but she wanted to speak to me. And I knew what was up already, right? And she she said, I've been coming to these youth conferences for years. I think she was like 21 at this point. And I've, I've always struggled with something and I've never told anybody about it. <laughs> and of course, I've been through all the safety right, training. Right, I'm right, terrified right, of this right, conversation. Right, right. So at this point, I'm How like, well, I you don't have to this? tell me. You can tell somebody else, but I pro- I'll respect what it is. She's like yeah. such a weirdo. Yeah. Um, but then she said, like, I've been, I've been looking at porn ever since I was, I forget what she said, eight or nine. Yeah. And I gave that girl the most affectionate side hug 
Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you healed everything, right? <laughs> oh, I, but I did. I just said to her, you beautiful thing. I said, I love you. You're yeah, good. You're yeah, good and yeah, you're beautiful yeah. and you're not a freak and you're not the ugly things yeah, yeah, you tell yeah, yourself that you are. Right. And that's the thing. And, is, and is, just real quick, and then I said to her, but I need you to go to confession Yeah. and then I need you to come and tell me what you've done. Yeah. Next morning, she looked like a totally different person. She was skipping up to me with the most that's beautiful so awesome. smile on her face. She said, confession was so beautiful and I think there is a special place in heaven for priests who are kind in confession. Yeah. Because you know, he could have, he could have, you know, I mean, I'm sure you're cognizant of this as a confessor. People come bring this stuff to you that if you're, if you're harsh with them, even maybe unintentionally, yeah. like, you can really do some damage when people are in that vulnerable state. So no, God bless it, that in priest. In fact, I actually, I, I mentioned when I'm at the conferences, I always pull the priest aside the, the, on Friday night before we get started and said, you know, some of these kids, it's going to take everything mm -hmm. they have That's to it. come up and, and um, just to do our best to be as compassionate. But again, I, I always go back to, uh, the woman caught in the act of adultery, you know, is there no one here to condemn you? And yeah, you know, we need to, we need to speak in truth and charity and humility, but there are kids that are really, really suffering and, and we can be dismissive about that. And, and I, yeah. again, I've had enough. And you can get hard into it when you encounter the same thing again and again and again and again, and yeah. you forget that this is the first time this person yeah, is bringing exactly. this I thing to you. Another, this was actually a friend of mine. And, and I honestly, I kind of thought maybe he struggled with being gay and, um, we were just having a conversation and uh, he said, I need to talk to you. I said, okay. And he said, um, it's about the worst thing you can imagine. <laughs> and this was a patricide. This was a moment of grace. Uh -huh. And I said, you're dying. He said, <laughs> and he said, no. And I said, Oh, whew, that's the worst thing I could imagine. And then he just shared with me that he was struggling with same sex attractions. And, um, but again, there, and I'm sure you've experienced it. Mm -hmm. when, when you're walking and, and you see somebody in front of you, it reminds us it's a person. Mm -hmm. It's a person who's who's afraid, who's struggling, and and we just need to be able to be present. And that's there. There lies, I think, the balance. I mean, yeah. I mean, you can go to the other extreme, and yeah. And, and so, well, some, here's another attention. story, and I think it may have been the Holy Spirit who guided this conversation because what I'm about to say might sound really harsh to people, and I wouldn't ever use this as like a blanket statement to anyone yeah. who came yeah. up to me. But this fella comes up to me, and he's really having a difficult time telling me that he has same sex attraction, and for whatever reason, I'm like, you know, you're not special, right? Yeah. You don't think I struggle with crap all yeah. the time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. it's not us versus you. Yeah, We're just all so in this right? together. Exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but he ended up writing a book for Life Teen on, uh, on uh, same-sex attraction. Really? Yeah, oh, that's and awesome. he mentions that encounter at that that's awesome. Franciscan yeah, yeah. conference. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, before I forget, we have a question here from Orlando. Any chance that university grows and there are satellite campuses throughout the country, Texas... And when could that happen? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. We're actually yeah. talking a lot about that. And, and what does that look like for us to grow? And what is that for us to have a bigger tent? Uh, one, of the, one of the things that I struggle with is that at times people say, you should just do what you do at Steubenville here. I, I firmly believe there's a particular anointing and there's a particular grace. And that can't necessarily be replicated. It's, you know, the friars are part of that. You can't just go and create something. So we're, we're asking that question. You know, we're looking at perhaps having pods in, you know, in some major cities where mm. you can maybe connect to a large parish or community that we can have some of the outreach there. So stay tuned. That's one of the things that we're really question with right now what does it look like for us to be able to reach out to a broader population all right two things i want to hit before you leave and i'll ask you neil to put links in the description below one is if there's parents or like teenagers watching right now and they want to learn more about franciscan because maybe they want to come here next year and do life with us yeah, yeah. how That'd do they awesome. do that franciscan.edu and what, what, like, what's the, can they just, what do they do? I don't understand. Do they just write and do they send them a package or something? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. If you're interested, right. If you go to the website and there's all kinds of information that tells our story. And, and first off, it, yeah, it just tells the story of the university. And then if they're a student who wants information, perspective information, we make all that available to them. Okay. Franciscan.edu. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other question I have is we have these beautiful Steubenville. Isn't that funny? They're called Steubenville Youth Conferences in other cities. It is. Well, it started because we were doing conferences before. They, they changed the name to Franciscan University in the late 80s and we were already doing these Steubenville conferences. Oh, I didn't realize yeah, yeah, yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. We that kinda makes wished, more sense We kind of wish we would have done it differently, but what do you okay. do? Because you know, there's such a name brand right now. Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. All right. So if people wanted to attend a Steubenville youth conference or a Franciscan, what, yeah. what do they do there? Same thing. If they went to Franciscan EDU, they can find the conferences. I'm, I should know this. Yeah. If you just find it, yeah, we'll there, put the link okay, in the description below. There's a link below. for Franciscan conferences. Because they're everywhere now. Yeah. 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 Well, not everywhere, yeah. but they're yeah. all across the country in North America. At least yeah. busing distance. Good, so you can just put a link in there. See, Bob and I don't do links. 
in our podcast, you but you Why? guys do links because we don't know what the heck you we're You don't doing. have a Neil. Yeah, that's right. We Neil crushes it. There you go, Neil. He asks questions like, They're what's already it? It's already in there. Look at that. And he's, that. All, and he's also like, what's a wild goose chase? Feels like you should have known that. If you, <laughs> he didn't say that. <laughs> judgment all around. <laughs> <laughs> I just started reading The Lord of the Rings to my son last night. Yeah. Just last night. Can just finish the Okay, can I just forgive me? I just... I don't know. I, I'm, what I'm about to say may be heresy. No, you don't have to may, like it. It may be heresy, okay? I'll tell you. Okay, thanks. Um, <laughs> I, okay, this is, I'm about to make a confession here. Here we, that go. Is, here we go. Is this confession being, is still on recorded? Pints with the Quinn. Is this still recorded? It is. Are you sure you want us to cut to, cut yes. to black? Or? Okay, I never read Chronicles of Narnia. Yes. Who cares? They're gorgeous. They're so okay. My ne- no, they're beautiful. Yeah. My niece and I, a number of years ago, read them. She lives in Cleveland. I was in D.C. at the time. I love, I love them. Have you read The Lord of the Rings? I just said this is confession. No. Okay. If you think Nani is good. Really? Realms but, but, of pleasure. It's like a cigarette versus a thick Cuban. What are you doing? you got to do it. You really? got to invest. I promise but, but you. Here's the thing. So in the movies, again, I'm, I'm so... No, no, the I'm, movies are, were beautiful. But it just, some of the fight scenes go on forever it's oh just, you know what goes on forever is tolkien's description of trees yeah, <laughs> and yeah. forests and yeah i mean <laughs> well, can i can i go back to this did you okay i, I appreciate that you love tolkien's but did you like lord um chronicles of narnia i didn't really like it i read the line the witch in the wardrobe you ever read them all I tried okay, reading. Coming, yeah, coming, that's coming, right. Coming, I'm getting yeah. it again. No, I, I read a couple of the other ones. I, I read uh, what was one with Diggory, uh, Magician's nephew. I read, yeah. and I also read the Last Battle. But I didn't like either of them that much. Oh, I loved them. I just thought they were beautiful. And I just thought beautiful. the allegories he laid on too thick. And I would like to read them to my. I'm glad that you love them. Yeah. And maybe maybe you shouldn't yeah, read Lord of the Rings. I don't no, know. Well, but, maybe I should. But you should. No, you're not the first person to tell just me. Put that. down the Bible, Father, yeah. and pick up the Lord of the Rings. Yeah. yeah. That's a good idea. But I'm trying, I'm wondering how to get, how to get into it. Like how would, cause it's like, there's other authors. I love Dostoevsky and he, he's got some lovely short stories and novellas that mm-hmm. I'd say to someone, if you're not sure if you could like Dostoevsky or Tolstoy, read this, read, Sorry, here, read, yeah, yeah. read the death of Ivan Ilyich or something. And if you like it, then you well, can. Well, some people have said to me that, that, uh, yeah, it was a gateway drug that Chronicles of Narnia was a gateway into yeah. that. So maybe I just need to give it a yeah, shot. Tolkien's like Aquinas. It's an, it's Everest. How do you come at yeah, it? Yeah, it's yeah, just, yeah. It's just, it's worth it, though. All right, all right. Me and Mike all Welker right. read the books last year, oh, June, sure. July, and <laughs> I'm sure. Actually, when, just as you said that, when Mike and I and Cindy lived together in, in Austria, and on Thanksgiving Day, they would show all three movies the same day, the extended. They three, are I big mean, nerds. Had, unbelievable. Some of the most beautiful people I've ever met. I'm so glad we live three doors down from them. They are just delightful, yeah, yeah. good people. Yeah, yeah. I texted Cindy. This is one of the beautiful things about living in Catholic community. It's walking distance. Yeah, I yeah. texted to Cindy last night and I said, do you guys have any Kahlua? Hashtag not an alcoholic. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, she's like, problem. I've left it on the table. I'm heading out. I'm headed out. Come get it. And I know which door's always yeah, yeah, open. Yeah, yeah. I go into a house. Take that's the so Kahlua. funny. Yeah. No, that's great. I mean, Catholic communities do other things. But it's free, good. yeah, free Kahlua. I mean, free Kahlua. you're mixing it with cream. What were you doing with it? Oh, white Russians are the best. Yeah, yeah, what's exactly. your favorite drink? Uh, probably a uh, single malt. I mean, yeah. just straight up. What's your favorite scotch? Go to is Belvani. The Belvani Caribbean cask. Is I haven't fact, had that. You've not had the Belvani no. Caribbean cask. It's have you not had Belvani at all? No, I don't think so. Oh, Belvani is really, really, really. That's my really favorite. Lagavulin. Lagavulin is really, really I mean, good. It's, it's, it's uh, I kind of feel about that that I do about IPAs. Um, it's, it's really smoky and I like to have it every now and then. I see. But like just kind of a day to day, the Belvini 12, Belvini oh, Caribbean nice. cask is just really, really nice. Good. Father Dave, thank you so much for coming on the show. God my bless pleasure. you. My pleasure. pleasure. God bless pleasure. you.